And I do want to announce that we didn't just give the Republicans cucumbers, we gave them bologna <laughs> and salami and some ham. It really is. It really is all well, That'll be corrected. Um, <laughs> Ms. Baldwin, uh, you seek recognition for the purpose of offering an amendment, is that correct? That's correct. I have an amendment at the desk to Title I. Mr. Chairman, to Title I. Point of order. That would be Baldwin uh, 48. And uh, has the amendment been submitted in a timely manner? Yes, it has, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Uh, General ladies, recognize. I'd like to reserve a point of order. The gentleman re reserved a point of order on the amendment. Uh, clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. Baldwin of Wisconsin. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The general ladies recognized to uh, speak to her amendment for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Department of Energy currently administers two distinct technical assistance programs that serve complementary needs. Um, industrial assessment centers provide assessment services to small and medium-sized manufacturing facilities, while the combined heat and power clean energy application centers provide assistance and education on the implementation of combined heat and power systems in building and, end, um, and industry. The amendment that I am offering um, consolidates these DOE-administered university-based centers so that they can, um, and also organizes them into a nationally consistent network so they can better provide education and outreach to professionals as a way to encourage deployment of existing clean energy technologies. Further, this amendment creates a building center component for a fully integrated approach to better utilizing energy efficiency op um, opportunities. Individually, the um, ind industrial assessment centers and the clean energy application centers have proven to be very successful and uh, efficient uses of federal funds. Um, but by coordinating these programs, we can best leverage the strength that they already uh, boast. These strengths include unique understandings of regional energy efficiency needs, strong relationships with local stakeholders, researchers, and thought leaders in the area of energy efficiency, and access to individual region-specific networks of other buildings, businesses, and entities that firms look to regularly for energy-related advice. As a complement to the industrial assessment centers and the clean energy application center programs, this amendment provides for the establishment of building assessment centers to provide these same strengths, for example, training of engineers, architects, and building technicians in energy efficient design and operation for the building sector, uh, promotion of high efficiency building construction techniques and high efficiency materials options, um, and identification of opportunities for optimizing energy efficiency and environmental performance in existing buildings. The impact of the, these three uh, Department of Energy programs will be enhanced through designation of no more than 10 centers for energy and environmental knowledge and outreach, geographically dispersed nationwide, that will serve as a hub, a place for one-stop shopping, where a variety of energy needs can be coordinated, met, and served by region-specific industrial, building, or clean energy assessment centers. In crafting this uh, language, I worked uh, extensively with the Department of Energy and have the full support of the Ameri American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. And Mr. Chairman would yield back my remaining two minutes. Well, would you yield to me? I would you have be some time happy left to yield to the chairman. Because I, 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 the Department of Energy uh, supports expertise in regional centers called industrial assessment centers and clean energy application centers. They provide valuable services at very low cost to industry and others in helping them adopt new efficiency approaches, clean energy technologies, best practices, reducing costs and preserving jobs. And I, I want to commend you for this uh, amendment. I think it's a good one, and I urge our colleagues to support it. Yield back the balance. You yield back. The I yield back the balance Mr. of my time. Chairman, gentleman from Michigan, uh, is recognized. Last word. Gentlemen, is recognized for five minutes. I'm not minutes. so sure that our side is so excited about the amendment uh, because of the cost. I know that uh, as I have a number of universities in my district, uh, I have one in particular, uh, Western Michigan University, which has been a real leader on energy efficiency for some time. 
Uh, they've made the, the change with the light bulbs. Uh, they've, they've come in uh, with something that we've not done in this building that I wish the speaker would do, and that is to, to actually put a monitoring device in all of the rooms. They have, I think, at Western Michigan University, they have some 50-some 50, 50 buildings, and in virtually all the rooms when somebody leaves, the lights go out. The uh, temperature is adjusted, whether it's uh, cooling or heating, uh, based on whatever is more, more efficient. They've moved to electric vehicles. They have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxpayer money because it's a public university in terms of energy conservation. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's paid for, it will pay for the, uh, uh, for the installation of, of what they've done. They didn't need to be told how to do it. That we did, they didn't need federal money, uh, $50 million a year authorized indefinitely, as I understand in, in this amendment. Uh, they did it. Other universities have come to the to Kalamazoo, Michigan. They've they've watched what they've done. They've identified those savings, and it's it's a laudable goal. But I, I don't know that we need the money to do this. So we ought to be doing it under under existing uh, money, and they and they ought to be used. Uh, they ought to be looking at uh, different college associations and others, uh, so that the taxpayers don't have to actually fund fifty million dollars a year. I don't, I don't know how the gentlelady found $50 million a year for this, but w we could maybe accept it if you didn't have that $50 million. Why not just would, would gentlemen yeah, yield, yield to my... I, I'd like to ask Mr. a question Barton. to counsel. I've gone through this just quickly reading it. It looks like it authorizes $85 million a year indefinitely. What's the cost of this? And I realize it's an authorization, not an appropriation. But it, several places, one place it says $50 million a year. Another place it says $10 million a year. Would the gentleman place, yield? Be happy to. It, it, the, in total, I think you probably missed one. It was $90 million that is <laughs> added. Okay, um, well, thank you for being honest. And, um, and then, just so you know, um, the existing centers that this amendment also touches, um, uh, the they get CEAs, 30 million. The CEACs are authorized right now from 2008 fiscal year to 2012 at 10 million per year. You change the IACs, third. the industrial assessment centers, which um, uh, have a, a indexed um, uh, appropriation um, that we uh, were both. Both of these were incorporated in um, in the Energy Independence and Security Act, which is when we last um, sort of looked at the level of funding, but they're. You know, to, not specifically to your question, but these are things that pay for themselves because of the uh, the efficiency that's um, deployed through uh, these programs. And I would be really very much surprised, um, uh, Mr. Upton, if um, if the universities in your district didn't seek counsel from their regional um, uh, assessment center, which is uh, uh, in in your area uh, at, the, at the University of Michigan, um, I believe the Ann Arbor com campus. Yeah, I actually know that University of Michigan was so impressed with what Western Michigan University did. And again, Western Michigan University is in Kalamazoo uh, University, the big house uh, that's in Ann Arbor. University of Michigan was so impressed with what Western Michigan did, they actually sent a team to see what they did. They didn't. I, I don't. I don't know whether they actually needed one of these centers. They actually looked to see what Western did. And uh, they did. They did great things. They didn't. I don't think actually utilize uh, this center in terms of, of the uh, progress that they made. Well, is if if we accept with the with what's authorized plus what the change is the total authorization per year 110 million. Can you repeat the question? I said with what you're authorizing, that's new plus the change in the authorization of existing programs is the total. Authorization of this amendment, 110 million per year. No, it, 90 is my 90 count. I, I defer to council, make sure that my math is correct. But that's. <laughs> it, it's um, 50 for the new uh, building assessment centers, uh, 5 million per year for um, for the federal share of some of the training internship opportunities to get. More people with expertise in um, efficiency. Um, it is an increase for the um, for the clean energy application centers um, from from an authorized level of 10 million to an authorized level of 30. 
So that's plus 20. No, I want to cut it by about a factor of 10. I mean, I, it's an authorization, not an appropriation. Would the gentleman I, yield? Well, it's not. I'll speak. I'll be happy to, to yield Mr. Upton's time. Without a, a, be without glad a, to yield the gentleman. Without objection, Mr. Upton moment. will have an additional minute so that Mr. Barton can yield to you. Oh, I'm be happy to yield the gentlelady from Wisconsin. I, just, I know that there was discussion on previous amendments about how we come up with these numbers, but this was um, uh, in consultation with um, uh, the ACEE -E and um, also uh, uh, Department of Energy um, folks who were consulted in the crafting of this amendment, and that's their belief is what it will take to, to get this uh, greater coordination and greater um, impact of these programs. Gentleman yields back his time. Further discussion? Um, Mr. Chairman. The Democratic side and Mr. Stearns on the strike, Republican strike, side. Uh, the last word. Um, <coughs> I think most of us uh, have not really read this, so I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Of the money that goes, how much goes to the university itself as opposed to funding interns and um, energy? Secretary of Energy Department employees, in other words, of this money, how much is going to government administration? How much is actually going to be given to the university? Um, I, I believe that um, all of this passes through to these university-based um, new building assessment uh, centers of that allocation of the $5 million for the internships that would be passed through ultimately to um, with matching dollars, by the way, with, to the um, people engaged in those internships. You say there's 10 regional centers. They all have to be set up with employees, right? Or are they existing? The, the, um, all of these things are called centers, so I want to make sure we're, t um, we're understanding. The, the new centers that are authorized in this um, uh, amendment um, are are not in existence now. They can, uh, uh, DOE can designate up to or no more than 10 centers for energy and, um, energy and environmental knowledge and outreach. They would be um, dispersed uh, geographically nationwide and are intended to coordinate the activities of the three centers within them, the Industrial Assessment Center, the Clean Energy Application Centers, and the new building assessment now, centers. Will the money be going to private institutions or state institutions? How will the Secretary right. of Energy make that decision? Who will make the decisions which universities get what? How, how would a university seek to get part of this roughly $100 million? There's a number of criteria that are laid out in the bill. Um, the, these new centers that are being created have to be based on the existence of either an industrial assessment center or um, a, a, a Clean Energy Application Center already at that um, institution or one of the new building assessment centers at that institution. Um, and then they, again, have to be uh, geographically distributed throughout the country. Um, and, and there's a number of other criteria listed in the bill, um, but it is the Department of Energy that would make those assessments. They would competitive, so, competitively bid. So a university would have to set up an industrial center before they could actually bid? Um, it, it, the industrial assessment centers already exist. At, at all the universities? No, there are, um, for industrial, uh, I bl let me just tell you how many there are. Well, um, I mean, just for Those are, general. I think, eight of them nationally. Oh, sorry, yeah, 26 of them university-based. The criteria would be they'd set up an industrial center at a university, both a private and a state university could get money. For example, a private university in Washington, D.C. could get some money as well as a state university, and there's no difference in the criteria, either one could get the same amount of money depending upon their need. How, how would a university determine whether one university gets five or ten million because it seems like hundred million dollars is a lot of money, but when you spread that across fifty states with all the universities, privates, it's, it's, you know. Well, the gentleman yield? Sure. I, I don't think every university will get this. There's a certain number of universities that are already involved in this, and this would uh, bring a new building assessment center with the existing industrial assessment centers, clean energy application centers, 
all under a group of 10 new regional centers for energy and environmental knowledge and outreach based at major universities. Well, but not all of them will have it. Okay. So you're this is in pork. This is for everybody to have one. It's for yeah. accomplishing some goals. So what you're saying is the university will not get money unless they establish this industrial center. That's a prerequisite. I believe that's and then, correct. And then a uh, university after that does that on their own dime, then they could apply for the grant and they would get it and the Secretary of Energy would make the decision whether they get the money and how much. What's this typical profile okay. of a grant? In other words, let's say, say a state university applies and has industrial center. How much do you think the is there a limit to how much one would get, or is this spread over evenly? It, one of your, the premise of your question wasn't quite correct. Okay. So, for example, um, industrial assessment centers, the University of Florida has one, for example. Those have been authorized for many, many years. We adjusted the authorization level um, in the um, Energy Efficiency and, um, uh, and Security Act. Um, that program in this fiscal year is uh, nationwide uh, um, authorized at $190 me, million. Dollars. I'm just going to finish so, here. So if it, if it, if it um, say the University of Florida wanted then to become one of these new centers, um, they would apply, it would be a competitive, uh, 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 in a competitive nature, and the idea is they'll be up to 10 geographically dispersed throughout the country. Uh, I would just conclude by saying, you could make the argument, convince our side, if you could actually show by spending this money, you would recapture and save money at every university in a period of five, six, seven years, it would pay for itself. Have you done a study on that? Or is there any analysis of that? The, I, I know that the intent of the existing centers is to have cost-effective energy efficiency strategies deployed and get that, as well as um, uh, training the next generation of, of engineers and architects, et cetera, uh, who, who are going to be able to help us achieve these goals. But I do not have anything specific in terms of um, the, the number of years uh, that, that this could be paid for by the deployment of these technologies. Gentleman's time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Oh, Mr. Barton. I want to ask some questions of the council. The, the, uh, Waxman substitute manager's amendment has a complete title too and called energy efficiency building energy efficiency programs doesn't isn't the uh, section 172 and 173 of the Baldwin amendment rendered superfluous if we adopt title 2 as it is Doesn't Title II set up a federally mandated energy efficiency building code program? The, the centers that the Baldwin Amendment refers to are based at universities but provide expertise that is um, offered through outreach to the entire community as to how, for example, in the industrial assessment centers, Industry can use best practices to achieve energy efficiency. And the new building centers, builders can adopt new materials and new practices to achieve energy efficiency. Building codes are a minimum legal standard to which a building must be met. But and these are federal mandates. Doesn't that override what Mrs. Ba Ms. Baldwin is attempting to do? Uh, no, it would not, because the building codes that would be part of the federal mandate would rely on the kind of expertise that these centers would develop in terms of how to make buildings that are much more efficient. Okay. Well, um, thank you. I just, I want to have, make a few comments and then I'll be no, happy. You're still, you're yeah. still on your own time. Yes, I think. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss here, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have a, a program, there's nothing wrong with what Ms. Baldwin's attempting to do here, except that it's going to cost approximately $100 million a year if it's fully funded. And we just rejected the uh, Blunt Amendment to try to put a price cap on residential electricity rates. Again, this is an authorization, it's not an appropriation. 
but a hundred or ninety five million dollars a year is real money um, and once you set these centers up uh, they're going to develop their own constituencies they're going to be very adept at, at lobbying the Congress for funding um, I mean I would think that you might want to I'm not sure if we want to do either one but I don't think you do mandated building codes and then do this also I, I, I this is way way too expensive um, as it's currently structured so I would strongly oppose the amendment I might also point out that um, she's actually given us two amendments because she creates a new section 172 and a section 173 which normally that would be two amendments instead of one so I think there's a little bit of a problem. Will, will the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to yield to um, Mr. Whitfield. Thank you for yielding. Uh, obviously, this is a laudable goal, and I happen to serve on the board of governors of a university, and every university in the country right now, their endowments have gone down. They've lost a significant amount of money in their endowments. They've, they're, they're having to reduce uh, programs, funding for programs. Some of them they even had to uh, dismiss some professors, like the University of Florida, for example. And um, all of them want additional money from the federal government uh, for their existing programs. And the, the, the question I would have about this is the, the, the reality of the appropriators actually appropriating $100 million for a new program to help assess uh, environmentally friendly uh, building codes or whatever. When, when the real job of a university is to educate uh, students, uh, and, and certainly this would be one way to educate students, but it just seems to me while it's laudable, there's nothing wrong with this program, the reality is that the funding is just not going to be available. I yield, back. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I oppose the amendment. Further discussion? of the amendment, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Ms. Baldwin said she had a list of the universities that had existing centers. I, I would like to yield to her for the purpose of her reading the, that list of universities. Uh, I'd be pleased to do that. The industrial um, assessment centers are located at 26 universities. The University of Alabama, Bradley University, Colorado State University, University of Dayton, University of Delaware, University of Florida, Georgia Institute of Technology, University of Illinois Chicago, Iowa State University, um, Lehigh Univer University, University, University of Louisiana at Lafayette, University of Massachusetts, University of Michigan, University of Missouri, University of Miami, Mississippi State University, North Carolina State University, Oklahoma State University, Oregon State University, San Diego State University, San Francisco State University, Syracuse University, Tennessee Technological University, Texas A&M University, University of Washington, and West Virginia University. Sadly, not University of Wisconsin, <laughs> but anyways. Uh, uh, with regard to the clean energy application centers, there are eight Six of those are, from what I can tell, are university-based. Um, University of Maryland, uh, University of Illinois at Chicago, University of Massachusetts Amherst, Washington State University, University of California Berkeley, and Mississippi State University. I thank the gentlelady for the clarification. I will add to what the ranking member was just discussing when he said, there was a duplication in Title II in the provisions that talk about the building codes and how those would be set. Well, I would add that another redundancy with, with this amendment is in this um, Mr. Dingle's amendment today, which is subtitle J, dealing with nuclear and advanced technologies. We placed a provision, there's a provision in there that is the Clean Energy Deployment administration under the direction of the administrator of the administration and the board of directors. 
So what we have is a third already. Look at what we are doing. You've got three entities that are going to be involved with delivering what appears at first glance to be the same type service and have the same expectations and you're going to have this money um, hundreds of millions of dollars that are going to go into something that we have already covered in Title II and also previously in Subtitle J earlier today and with that I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back her time. Any? Uh, yes, Mr. Gingrey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. I, in, in regard to, to this, I, uh, again, I'm looking at Title II uh, in regard to energy inf efficiency, uh, and it, it says DO, Department of Energy, would provide funding to states to implement, impl implement these requirements uh, in regard to um, both uh, commercial and residential buildings uh, to improve energy efficiency. And as I look at uh, uh, the gentlelady's amendments, I mean, it, it's already been mentioned, but another $100 million a year, uh, to me, it just seems like that uh, money is no issue. Money is no issue. I mean, I'm, I'm not really questioning uh, the worthiness of the amendment and, the, and, and Ms. Baldwin's uh, thoughts behind this, but it seems to me that we're already doing it and uh, it's just duplicative, and why would we just nonchalantly uh, amend this bill so that we could spend another hundred million dollars a year? I, for that reason, I'm 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 opposed to it, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Uh, are we ready for the vote? The vote now comes on the Baldwin amendment. All those in favor of the amendment will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Uh, roll call, the, Mr. Chairman. The ayes appear to have it. The gentleman requests a roll call, and the clerk will call the roll. And yes, thank you very much. The point of order has been withdrawn. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman, aye. Mr. Dingle. You're for it. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Ms. Gett. Ms. Gett, aye. Mrs. Caps. Mr. Doyle. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky, aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley. Aye. Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Barton, no. Mr. Hall, Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton, Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns, Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal, Mr. Deal, no. Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus, Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, no. Mr. Radonovich. No. Mr. Radonovich, no. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, no. Ms. Bono Mack. No. Ms. Bono Mack, no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. No. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers. Mrs. Myrick, Mrs. Myrick, no. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania, no. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Blackburn, Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Gingrey, no. Mr. Gingrey, no. Mr. Scalise, no. Mr. Scalise, no. Mr. Dingle. Votes aye. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, aye. Mr. Stupak. Yes. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, aye. Mr. Green, I'm sorry. Mr. Green, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes aye. Have all members responded to the roll? Any member wishes to change his or her vote? If not, we'll tally the vote. I understand, I understand that the caterers brought all the, the, the good stuff to this, your side. The, 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 yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yes. On that vote, the yeas were 30 and the nays were 19. 30 ayes, 19 noes, the amendments agreed to. Um, who did I go to? Mr. Mr. Terry. For what gentleman seeks recognition for an amendment to this title? It is titled MPB 2593. And has, will the clerk inform us whether the time yeah, frame is, MB2. the time limitation oh, has been met? <laughs> it's also gasoline price increases title. Is that okay with the, with the council? Ms. Davis. Uh, yes, it was received in a timely manner. Will you uh, report, report the amendment? Amendment to H.R. 2454 offered by Mr. Terry. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized to uh, uh, speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'd like to have uh, unanimous consent to add five words. Four. 
uh, after the comma in 2009 dollars in, uh, in paren comma to add as a result of implementation of this act comma. Without objection, that will be the order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, uh, it, with this uh, act uh, covering all areas that emit or industries that emit uh, CO2 includes all fossil fuels, which also includes gasoline, uh, which is part of uh, everyday life. It's ubiquitous to our culture. Uh, we need it to go to work. We need it to take uh, the kids to school. Uh, we need it to uh, move goods and services. Uh, and the studies that I've seen uh, show that there will be substantial increases in the cost of gasoline at all grades. Uh, and what I would like to do with this amendment is to suspend the act if the price per gallon hits $5 per gallon. Now, at the current time, uh, according to the Energy Information Administration, uh, the current price per gallon national average is $2.29. I can tell you in Omaha when I filled up on Sunday afternoon at the BP Amico on the corner, uh, for the higher grade it was $2.35. Uh, so the $5.00. Uh, that I've put in here as the trigger is double what the price per gallon is. So it has to have a 100 percent increase before it's triggered uh, and has to be the result of this act. Now, uh, I just want to quote from one uh, heritage study that uh, came out this last week, actually it came out Monday, uh, that is a result of the uh, uh, revision, the substitute that was released on Thursday that showed that as a direct result of this act that gasoline prices per gallon would go up 74%. Uh, so I've kind of put it on the outside of that purposely. Uh, but frankly, we all lived through last summer when gas hit $4 per gallon and the effects that it had on our everyday life. Families were making choices, cutting back on driving. I think the end result is that uh, people started using or began using their car less to the tune of about 15%. And it's pretty, stayed pretty static there. Uh, it, the heritage says that because of the increased prices, we can see another 15 percent drop in usage, which I'm sure is part of the end game. But it's also because of the higher prices. This is going to affect small businesses, uh, but I'm focusing here on the family budget. Uh, they don't. They don't want price of gas back at uh, $4 or $5. Uh, so this is to eliminate the risk. It's to hedge against the huge increases that some of us feel are coming because of this act. Uh, so I would encourage all of my uh, colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join me on this. It should be of little risk, but maybe of some peace of mind to our constituents. Uh, that we are not going to allow the price of gas to go over $5 per gallon because of this act. So at that point, uh, I will yield back the rest of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. Are there any members on the majority side That's seeking exactly. recognition to speak on this amendment? The, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I've listened very carefully to the amendment, and I'm in opposition to the amendment. Uh, there's no question that America is addicted to foreign oil. That goes without saying. Uh, that is a, a tremendous problem that we all face. 
Uh, the bill that we have before us will help solve that problem. It will move us away from our addiction to foreign oil. It will help us build a clean energy, low carbon future. And it will help America lead the world in creating the technologies for energy independence. But this amendment, as I understand it, proposes to, to press the eject button on our clean energy program if someone thinks that this bill has a certain effect on gasoline prices. Uh, the amendment is really just an attempt to undermine this bill. And so, Mr. Chairman, let's, let's look at the facts. According to expert studies by the EPA, the per gallon gas price changes that might result from putting a cap on emissions from fuel are very small, about two cents a year over the life of the program. Last year, and we all remember this, uh, we saw gas prices go up by two dollars. And where did that, those dollars go, Mr. Chairman? Uh, to hostile regimes overseas that are trying to hurt our country. Uh, but for two cents, we can move to a clean energy economy. We can do something about the dependency on oil that chains us to the whims of OPEC oil ministers and exposes us to the price escalating effects of the growing Chinese demand for oil. We need to be a lot more concerned about the $2 a gallon increases that come from staying hooked on oil than two cent increases from moving off of it. Uh, let's be clear, Mr. Chairman, an amendment like this would send a signal to American industry not to invest in developing ways to cut our use of imported oil and make our cars more, inf more efficient. And so, Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to reject the amendment. I yield the back. Yield? The gentleman yield? Yes, I will yield. I thank the gentleman very much. Yes. And I can't agree with the gentleman more. If the price of a gallon of gasoline is going over $5 a gallon, that's the very reason why we need this bill. We need to create a whole new way of, do, of domestically producing energy here in the United States. That's what this whole electric vehicle revolution is about. It's using renewable um, uh, energy uh, so that people can plug in this next generation of vehicles at home. Uh, it's why we're putting so much money into carbon capture and sequestration, so that coal can play a role in generating uh, low-carbon uh, electricity, so that people can plug in their car at home. We right now are in the eye of the storm. Four dollars a gallon of gasoline a year ago. Now it helped to induce a recession, from which we are now uh, recovering. The price of a gallon of gasoline went up seven cents last week. We don't have a lot of time to put in place a plan that avoids sending us back to where we were last spring at $4 a gallon, much less $5 a gallon. This is our opportunity to put in place a plan for the future. That's what this debate is all about. It's about green energy jobs, but it's about energy independence. We produce 8 million barrels of oil a day in the United States. We import 13 million barrels of oil a day. OPEC uh, has uh, us where they want us. OPEC can increase the price of oil anytime they want on us because they are the marginal supplier of oil to us and to the world. That's our weakness. Our strength is that we are the technological giant on the planet. Our strength is that we have a chance here to put together a revolution in renewable energy fuels, in electric vehicles that will break our dependence upon oil and drive down dramatically the amount of oil that we import and, as a result, dramatically reduce the likelihood that we will see the dramatic spike that we saw in oil prices last year. That's really what this whole debate is about. We don't want to see the price of gasoline go over $5 a gallon, but if it does, that only reinforces more the need for this legislation, more the need for us to put in place uh, a way that we use our technological genius. And it only reinforces more why it was so important what happened on the White House lawn today, where the President, with all of the auto company executives, announced that their goal now is not 35 miles per gallon by the year 2020, but now 35 miles per gallon on average by, by 2016. That's the kind of action we need to take. We need to use our technology to reduce dramatically. The auto executives are on board. 
The auto executives are saying they want to move towards this electric vehicle future that we have included in this bill, but we have not seen the understanding of the depth of this problem yet. Well, and will the I gentleman yield? I, I, my the gentleman from um, North Carolina. Yeah. Well, it's my time, and I believe it has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The Thank you, Mr. Butterfield. I appreciate that. Yeah. All I was going to do was ask you to provide me the site on that EPA uh, statistics. I'll get my staff to get it to your staff, sir. I appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm very supportive of the uh, Terry Amendment. My question would be, how many U.S. industries do we want to bankrupt in one markup? Um, the, the, the automobile industry is on its knees, and it, this announcement today that they've accelerated the CAFE standard mandate from 2020 to 2016 is not going to make the automobile automotive industry more robust. We've already got one in bankruptcy, Chrysler. You're probably going to have General Motors in bankruptcy within the next month or so. Bless their heart, Ford Motor Company, which didn't take advantage of the loans, didn't ask for the loans, uh, is apparently in strong enough shape that it doesn't yet need federal assistance. Uh, and I would emphasize yet. Now, now we have an amendment by Mr. Terry for the refinery industry, Mr. Green and Mr. Gonzalez, and maybe others, I don't know, but I know those two have been working like Trojans <clears throat> to get some allowances for the refinery industry. And my understanding is that they got 2% for two years beginning in 2014. Now that may be erroneous and, and they may have done, a, done better than that. Um, but. Um, the Terry Amendment simply says if gasoline prices go above $5 a gallon uh, because of this act, keep in mind that right now they're a little over $2. They've been as high as in, some, in California uh, several years ago. They were up over $4. Uh, they, they, the average uh, in the country was a little below 4 before they declined. But if they go back over five, we'll suspend this act. Now, we keep being told that nothing that the majority is doing is going to cause price rises anywhere. We're somehow going to defy the laws of economics, and we're going to have a cap on CO2, uh, man-made CO2, that starts, I think, in the first year at a little over four billion metric tons goes up for a couple of years and then over the next 30 years declines down to about a thousand uh, million tons or, or, or one billion metric tons. Uh, but somehow no prices are going to rise anywhere. Now we learned from council that uh, these allowances that are given to the local distribution company, somebody's going to buy them, but that's not going to cause a price rise anywhere. Uh, so all Mr. Terry is doing is saying in, the, in, in something that for most Americans is a basic necessity, gasoline that they use to, to, to go to work, to drive their families to school, um, that the commercial sector uses to provide gasoline and diesel for trucks and all this stuff, that if, if you guys are wrong and prices do go up, once gasoline reaches $5 a gallon, we're going to suspend the act. That's an insurance policy. That's a price cap. If we can put a cap on carbon, we darn sure ought to be able to put a cap on gasoline prices um, under this bill. It's, it's beyond me that we can't accept this amendment because if there's, there are very few people in the United States that don't use uh, gasoline uh, in their cars or trucks on a daily basis. And this, to me, is one of the more important consumer protection amendments. Uh, I strongly support it and hope that, uh, that we would adopt it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to yield back. Great. Gentleman yields back. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank my friend from Texas, uh, referring to Congressman Gonzalez and I as working like Trojans. Uh, 
My worry about, though, is this amendment might be that Trojan horse that will sack the city. Um, I have to admit, I've sat in Congress for a number of years and watched gas last year go up to uh, well over $4 a gallon around the country, maybe even $5 a gallon. But I didn't see any amendment like this that all of a sudden said, okay, let's start uh, doing different things. Uh, this amendment only says that if we get up to $5 a gallon, then uh, including taxes, then then we're going to not worry about carbon sequestration. I guess we could say the same thing about benzene and other things that uh, uh, that we have. That's what worries me that this uh, this amendment will put an artificial barrier on it. When those, frankly, those that gas could go up to five dollars a barrel based on the world market for crude, and that's where it was almost last time. I think California may have been close to five dollars a gallon last time. I know in Texas we were at you know, four dollars, and I, I tell people, even though we have refineries all in my district, we don't get a discount, except for our state taxes are just a little bit less than uh, maybe other states. But uh, but that's why this amendment's not a good amendment. It sets one issue up, and it's interesting for my colleague. Uh, price controls is something when the Republicans had majority for 12 years didn't want to talk about, and uh, and now because we're talking about carbon sequestration or environmental issues, we're going to talk about $5 a gallon. And again, that's why I think that uh, we may get $5 a gallon even before this bill is effective and what's going to happen to our constituents at the same time. What we need to do is not import 60 percent of our fuel or our crude oil and, uh, and produce it domestically or have alternatives on how we get around the country. And, uh, and hopefully this bill will get us to that point. Will, will the gentleman yield on that point? Be glad to. So. How does this what, Can you show me the provisions in here that allow us to develop America's great energy reserves? Oh, I've been frustrated with that for many years. But, you know, last Congress was the first time in a Democratic Congress we took off the control of outer continental shelf drilling. Oh, geez. Okay. And, I've been there. But, uh, but no, the I'll, question I'll, was in this bill. My time, it, the question was in this bill because you said. I don't know said, of any wells off the, port, off the Oregon coast. But let me reclaim my time. Um, we had that battle last year, and this Congress, a Democratic Congress and Senate, did away with the moratorium. But and, and the, the president were in control for 12 years, and we never talked about it. Never talked about it. Never got a bill out of. We did get a bill out of the House. Maybe we even got it out on Anwar, but the Senate wouldn't pass it. So, but that's why I don't think this amendment uh, is is ingenious in drafting. But uh, and Congressman Gonzalez and I have been working to make this bill work. Uh, for all of the country and not just uh, the coast, it also the Gulf Coast. But, uh, but that's why I think that gas may get the $5 a gallon next year, and it may not have anything to do at all with cap and trade. Maybe we ought to provide this where we suspend everything if it gets to $5 a gallon. Gene, Gene, will you yield for one second? I'll yield. I added uh, f some words that said as a result of the implementation of this act. So it wouldn't be because of world pressures. It would be as a result of this act. Well, Lee, that you back gets your to the point, if $5 a gallon is so bad, why shouldn't we do that for everything, including well, if, the if you would agree oil oil to make, make that amendment, we might accept yeah, it. I, I, Gene, I, I'll, make, I'll make do that unanimous amendment. consent for $3, $2.50. Mr. Green, would you yield, if I may? I'll yield back. To. Who else? <laughs> I, I would like. One of the uh, arguments in the bill We do is, drink wine in Texas. It will do that. We we'll talk about uh, global warming. One of the uh, um, bragging points on this bill was going to reduce our reliance on foreign oil. So I don't see the price of gas going up to five bucks uh, because of whatever happens on imports. Well, my argument is, is that 60 percent of our oil right now comes from imports. And so the, it's a world market price on crude. And if five dollars is such a uh, a major issue because of carbon, why don't we make $5 for anything and uh, uh, for any reason it goes above because our folks couldn't afford $4 last year, yeah. and, uh, but the market did come back down. Well, the, the, the point I'm making is that down. the bill was, uh, it was supposed to eliminate our dependence on foreign oil, so I don't see it going up to 5 bucks for, uh, for that if that's indeed the I'm hoping it bill. does, maybe 10 years from now or uh -huh. so that we will see less foreign oil imported. Of course, at the same time, coming from where I do, I want to I also see more domestic production. Thank you. Right. The gentleman's time has expired. Are other members seeking recognition? The chair 
recognizes the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a uh, this amendment kind of speaks to why Republicans and Democrats have really been talking in dual universes. Um, and it talks about, and I, I really have great respect for um, Mr. Markey and his impassioned approach uh, to this debate. But this whole markup, why we're having such a hard time, is the basic premise of climate change. And to fix it, you're going to charge for carbon. And we're saying that that additional cost for carbon is going to affect constituents. It's going to affect ratepayers. It's going to affect gas, Aline. Now, in the debate of energy security, which is what Republicans stand for, we want, we want an all-the-above energy portfolio. We wanted the Outer Continental Shelf, and I'm glad um, my friend Gene Green lauded the opening up of the OCS, but that was a Republican victory because of the Republican energy protest. It wasn't because the Democrat majority wanted to open up the OCS. And if everybody wants to uh, debate that with me, we'll, I'll be happy to debate that. That's what we did because we had an approach that we wanted lower gas prices. We wanted uh, our consumers to pay less. We wanted to have people not burdened by high energy prices. And who gets killed the most? There are 102 counties in the state of Illinois. I represent parts of 30. It takes me three hours to drive from one part of my district to another. That small town, that's rural. We have big trucks. You've heard me say this all in the last Congress. We have big trucks. We have working trucks. We have to drive long distances to schools, to health care, to buy groceries. We're not from the rich parts of this country. And what this bill is going to do is hurt the poor, rural Americans who rely on low-cost fuel to get from point A to point B. Two cents a gallon increase for a year? You have got to be kidding me. And if it is two cents a gallon, then you shouldn't mind this amendment. But this is another safety insurance policy that says to our voters, to our constituents that if your gas prices go up to $5 because of carbon, we're going to amend this act. I think that's a good bet because, and if, and if you believe what you say, this amendment does not hurt you. If you represent rural America where they drive big trucks to work, you need to support this amendment. If you have people that drive to long distances of school, to health care, to get groceries, travel three hours to get from one point in the district. But if you live in suburbia and you have mass transit and you're from the wealthiest district of this country, then this isn't going to affect you. That's why this is an important amendment. I will support it. I yield back my time. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Are there other members on the majority side seeking recognition to speak? Uh, on this amendment. The gentleman from uh, California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate the distinguished ranking member. Uh, he said that the auto industry is on its knees. And this is true. The auto industry is on its knees, but a large part of the reason is that they insisted on building gas guzzling cars. Well, now they've got religion, and they're going to build more fuel efficient vehicles. But the fact is that gas prices are volatile. They're going to spike. And if Americans burn less gasoline, the prices on average will be less. If we don't pass this bill, prices will be more volatile if consumers are going to get hurt in a periodic fashion. Another point I'd like to make is that if gas prices do go up to $5 a gallon, it's going to be very difficult to distinguish the market forces from the forces of regulatory impact. So uh, I don't think this amendment makes sense. I think it's going to hurt consumers. It's going to keep gas prices volatile. And I urge my colleagues to vote against it. I yield back to the uh, chairman. Hey, gentlemen's, uh, gentlemen's time has expired. Are there other members uh, seeking recognition? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I'm not aware of a study yet that shows passage of this bill will reduce the cost of energy. If somebody has one of those, I'd love to see it. 
Um, and so what it really amounts to is a national energy sales tax. And people are going to pay more. It's just a question of how much more and whether there are any emergency exits off this high-speed uh, freeway that this bill's on. And I think that's what troubles me most. Like my colleague from Illinois, my district's 70,000 square miles. I wish it only took three hours to drive one direction across it. Now, I happen to, here and in, in Oregon, drive hybrids on both ends. You can't put a trailer hitch on a Ford Escape hybrid. They don't allow that, okay? It's physically impossible, I guess. I tried. They rejected me at the dealership. So you can't put it on a hybrid. So as you develop all these new cars, and we've seen some of them on display out here, the three-wheel electric one and this and that, understand there's a whole bunch of America, rural America, that still needs workhorse trucks to haul workhorses and to haul cattle and to haul the other commodities that feed people all over the globe. They're going to pay more. They're going to pay a lot more. There are some on the other side of the aisle that simply don't like people that drive big trucks big diesel dually trucks. You hate them. I don't know you hate them individually, but as a class, you want them all in small, fuel efficient, something or others that may not actually do the job. And as a result, we're going to have people, they're going to lose their jobs. And I think that's what troubles me most about this. I hear a lot about the green jobs. The study out of the University of San Juan Carlos in Spain, from their experience, showed for every green job they created, they lost 2.2 other jobs. National Association of Manufacturers says you're going to lose a couple million manufacturing jobs in America. And a lot of the green jobs are being created out there, and they're in my district, and I, I don't have anything against renewable energy. I'm actually a pretty big advocate of it. But a lot of them are just installing the windmills, and then you leave. So a lot of the initial jobs are in installation, and then they're gone. What we lose permanently are the manufacturing jobs. Now let's turn to energy. Because the uh, chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Markey, made the point about how we need to use technology to develop all these new renewable biofuels, and we're going to have all this new renewable biofuel. And I have repeatedly, some of you may have noticed, talked about woody biomass. Woody biomass, I've got people in my district, scientists, engineers, all the kinds of people that we think America is all about, trying to turn woody biomass into renewable fuel. And they can do it. And when they do it, if that wood comes off the federal forests, you all in the energy bill at 07 said it doesn't count as renewable fuel. I tried to change that in my amendment, and you gleefully voted down. The chairman of the subcommittee, who on one hand says we've got to have new energy, new renewable biofuels get off petroleum, on the other hand, votes down the very amendment that would incent woody biomass to be converted into a liquid fuel source and count as renewable biofuel towards the nation's renewable fuel standard. Somebody explain to me how you can have it both ways? How can you have it both ways? You can't. But what you are going to end up with is an enormously expensive cost on Americans that are struggling. When it comes to the rebates on energy, we're just reading through this bill. Looks to me like you just socialize the rebate program and then stick it to anybody that still uses energy as if they're evil. And I don't happen to believe that's the case, because a lot of manufacturing uses a lot of energy. But you're not going to, you know, your, your make work pay tax credits and things are distributed evenly, even though, as my colleague from Tennessee has pointed out pretty clearly, and the data show, the energy costs aren't distributed evenly. Some regions of the country, actually mine, probably don't, aren't going to get hit as hard by higher energy as a result of this national energy sales tax bill as other regions, like the Midwest. And even in the Northwest, it depends upon how much of your, of your power comes from hydro. And yet, even hydro is discriminated against in this bill, and it's probably the most renewable, carbon-friendly energy on the planet. But oh, try and install new hydro if it affects the elevation of the water behind a dam at any location or time, it doesn't count. Can somebody explain to me how that suddenly makes the hydro non-renewable? And why you put that in your legislation? Anybody? You can't answer the question because there's no logical answer to it. It's politics. The deals have been cut and the bill's before us. You can change it, though. There's still an opportunity. We'll have amendments to make it better. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes himself.
And I do want to point out that we can have differences of opinion. We can think that there may be different consequences from policy decisions that we make. But I don't think it's fair to attribute to one side of the aisle or the other hatred for any one class of people or people who work for a living. And especially, I don't think it's fair to the Democrats who have always fought for working people. I must say, I, I just take exception to the idea that you would say the Democrats hate people who drive trucks. Now, this bill is attempting to make sure this country's national security is protected. So we're not dependent on having to bring in oil from countries that do not wish us well. We want new economic development in this country. And we think we'll get it from the legislation that we are offering. You can disagree with that. You can, you can disagree with it. I don't have any problem with that. And you can offer amendments. And in fact, this amendment is the same amendment that we've already voted on at least three times. If, if China doesn't have a bill equivalent to ours, the whole legislation's out the window. If electricity prices go up too much, the whole bill's out the window. If now, if gasoline prices go up too much, well, the whole bill is out the window. I, I think you're making a point, but I think you're making the point in a way that uh, we ought to move on. The point's already been made. I, I, um, I, I, I just think that um, we ought to be very careful how we talk about each other's opinions and recognize that we do have strong differences, but it doesn't mean that there are some in this committee, Democrat or Republican, that like one class or dislike another class. Every time anybody says we ought to do something for working people, I always hear people say, ah, oh, those Democrats are engaging in class warfare. It's not, it's not appropriate as part of the debate, and I uh, would hope members would refrain from that. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time, and I'll uh, recognize uh, the uh, gentleman, uh, gentleman from Arizona, higher seniority, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we have been debating whether or not uh, this legislation will raise the cost of energy here in America, whether it's electrical energy or gasoline, uh, as we're debating right now. Uh, somehow, it seems to me that Mr. Murphy said it quite correctly earlier, and that is that. It's pretty clear that what this bill does is it imposes additional costs on energy, on the emission of carbon dioxide. Currently, the emission of carbon dioxide is free. This imposes additional costs. The notion that it is not going to raise the cost seems bizarre. Uh, it seems to me a little bit like an Alice in Wonderland world. The entire goal, I submit, to raising the cost of carbon dioxide emitted when energy is produced is to raise the cost of that energy and to discourage the consumption of that energy so we produce less carbon dioxide. I don't see how in anything other than an Alice in Wonderland world you can have it both ways. It seems to me the President of the United States, a very eloquent gentleman, was very candid. He said bluntly during the campaign that the costs of energy were going to go up and going to go up dramatically. Indeed, I thought that was the purpose of this legislation. And during one of the hearings uh, that we had on this legislation, I believe we had a panel of somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 or 13 witnesses. Uh, I asked them a series of questions. One of the specific questions I asked was, uh, do each of you agree that the passage of this legislation will cause the cost of energy to go up in price to the consumers? And the answer from each and every single one of them was, yes, it will. Indeed, that was the design. Now, I understand that through negotiation, rebates have been negotiated or adjustments have negotiated, and there's an attempt to offset or to cushion those increases and to cushion them with regard to certain industries which uh, have overseas competition. Uh, or which produce excess carbon compared to other industries. Indeed, I spoke with Mr. Doyle. He said they carefully crafted it to protect 41 different carbon-sensitive, import-sensitive in industries. The point I want to make is there would be no point in negotiating those kinds of soft landings or those kinds of offsets if, indeed, the cost of energy weren't going to go up. The second point I want to make is the point I made to uh, uh, him at the time, which is, what happens to industry number 42? We negotiated 
rebates or soft landings or uh, adjustments for 41 industries, but what if we missed on industry number 42? There's a report from uh, Heritage dated yesterday written by uh, several of their scholars, William Beach, David Kurtzer, uh, Karen Campbell, and Ben Lieberman, uh, all of which analyzes this legislation and talks about electricity rates rising by as much as 90% after adjusting for inflation, uh, a rise in inflation-adjusted gasoline prices by 74%, a rise in residential natural gas prices by 55%, uh, a rise in the average family's annual energy bill by 1,500%. It, uh, it seems to me that it's pretty clear that the goal of the legislation is to increase energy prices, to discourage the use of energy which produces carbon dioxide, and to encourage us to move to other fuels. How can we sit here in the room then and say, well, these things aren't going to go up. Gasoline prices won't go up. Electricity won't go up. Uh, I don't understand how we can have it both ways, uh, and I don't understand how we can say that we're going to make everybody whole with taxpayer-funded rebates. And I, I agree with the gentleman we should refrain from personal uh, comments, and uh, I happen to have a Ford pickup truck. Uh, it's not a dually, and I don't think the Democrats in my district dislike my Ford pickup truck, but I am deeply worried about the impact of this legislation on my pickup truck driving and on all the other pickup truck drivers, and for that matter, on all of the other people uh, in this nation who have to pay uh, for their energy prices. And quite frankly, I do think it is a valid point to say that when you raise energy prices, you do disproportionately affect those who can least afford it. At least in my district in Arizona, people drive till they can qualify. What that means is that the lower income people in my congressional district have to drive way out of town from their jobs to find a home that they can qualify for. They drive older cars, they drive less fuel efficient cars, maybe not after they get to rebate their car and turn it in, although I'm not sure $4,500 will let them all turn in their car, uh, and they drive longer distances, and I think we're kidding ourselves if we do not think this will disproportionately affect those Americans. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Rogers. Did thank you. Did you seek recognition? Yes, okay. yes, thank Gentleman's you. Gentleman's I uh, was a little bit surprised, and I, it, it's maybe not the sense that we're, we're frustrated, Mr. Chairman, but uh, we're frustrated. And it's some of the things I heard even said in, in the debate, in this argument, in this debate, tells me that we're just two completely different places on something that we think we could be common ground. I mean, we've got our own bills to reduce the dependency on foreign oil, brings clean options, but it has to have everything. It has nuclear, clean coal, wind, solar, biomass, all of it. And this bill picks winners and losers for that. And it picks winners and losers for families and winners and losers for businesses. And when the, the uh, subcommittee chairman said that we're, we're, the recession is out, we're out of the recession, I think he actually said, used the word recovered, uh, there was 539,000 jobs lost last month. And that tells me that maybe, maybe in Washington, D.C. we're doing fine, but I'll tell you, back home, people are hurting and they are hurting bad. And if that, if that isn't the continuation of a recession, I don't know what is. 539,000 job losses? And he made a valid point. He said, uh, you know, if uh, when, when prices got up to $4.50, it accelerated uh, our recession, put people out of work. Absolutely it did. So all we're saying is, hey, let's not go down that road again. We've been there. We've had families lose everything because of it. Let's put a little insurance chit for the person who gets up in the morning and has to drive, on average, 40 miles to work. About 40 miles. That's American average. And I, it, when we do that, we're investing in their ability to have a home. This is a social contract of which you are all violating. And that social contract was, listen, we know that if we pr provide an incentive in the tax code, you can go out, buy your own home, and own your own home, and you get to pick the neighborhood. And if the schools aren't good, you ought to be able to try to move around and find the, and, and have that ability to have that little white fence and that grass in your yard and raise your kids to the standard of which you want. And if that means you have to drive a little bit further, you make that choice. You make that choice. But what you're saying is we don't want you to make that choice anymore. You don't get to pick your schools. You don't get to pick that house with the white picket fence. We know better than you because we're pretty darn smart. We're members of Congress. That's what you're saying. And the gentleman from California absolutely didn't take one second to understand the car industry. Not one second. 
the only cars that the big three, and by the way, the uh, foreign companies who were coming into the market here were making lots of money on were pickup trucks and SUVs and minivans. And what was the big investment from our foreign uh, producers who came into the markets by building, say, a big truck plant in Texas? It was a truck plant because they made money doing it. So uh, to, to, the, we ought to be just honest about what we're saying. We're saying is we're going to tell you, America, what kind of cars we want you to drive. I don't know if that makes us feel better or not. But matter of fact, you mandated to these car companies that they had, in order to meet the formula, they had to sell a certain number of small cars, even if they didn't make money doing it. How are we doing? Oh, that's right. One's in bankruptcy. One, on, one is on its way, and the other one is on its last leg. And oh, by the way, our foreign competitors aren't doing very well either. This has huge impact to somebody that has no control over what's happening in their lives right now. They have got to get up tomorrow morning, and they got to fill up their car. And maybe it's a minivan because they got three kids. And after work, mom is going to take somebody and drop them off and pick up the, their, their neighbor's kids and get them to soccer camp or get them to, to the cheerleading school. And oh, by the way, she's going to get groceries and come home and cook dinner, all of which we've now made more expensive for her in her average daily. Will the gentleman business. yield to me? I would absolutely. What are you doing for those people that have to spend a lot of money on gasoline? You're going to. You're going to uh, make the bill go away so the people who have jobs developing renewable fuels lose their jobs. The people that are working on uh, uh, but, but making Chairman, houses more uh, efficient, they'll lose their jobs. I'll reclaim. Well, we all ought to be together on this, not trying to play I, one I, up. I understand, but I'll reclaim. let me reclaim my time, Mr. Chairman. I understand it, your it point, your but the time. point is we have provided a great opportunity to unleash American innovation. And we've already seen that against Europe, we beat them with American innovation. This bill abandons American innovation. And we ought to say, let's do it all. We deserve to honor that social contract for those families who made those choices. I'm not talking, they're not living in big houses. Would the gentleman, gentleman yield? How have you yield? unleashed a great ingenuity for American, uh, as you oh, just claimed? And what? all of the above energy plan, Mr. Chairman, and we've got several that we're going to Oh, we haven't even today. seen that yet. The Please share it with us. It's, we'll, it's in the Republican alternative. We have it in the Republican alternative, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. You'll have a great opportunity to, to either pick American innovation and saving the folks who yeah. are struggling today or this big government mandate that didn't work in the housing industry and it didn't work in cars, but somehow it's going to work in your electric bills. I would ask unanimous consent that the gentleman be given one additional minute. Without objection. Would the gentleman yield to me? I would yield to me. I'd like to ask a question of the distinguished chairman since you just, that's the third or fourth time that you said that these Republican amendments that we're offering repeal the entire act. Would, would the gentleman accept the Terry Amendment if we amended it to only suspend Title III of the Act and let everything else stand? Title III is the cap-and-trade portion that's going to cause all the price increases. Well, that may, may or may not be true. Price increases in gasoline have gone up enormously over a year ago, and, and we didn't have cap-and-trade in place. What we had was a world market that went way up. What well, we have is a, a lower price now because of a world economy that is going quite downward. So why we should suddenly uh, stop the, the uh, limitation on carbon emissions? Stop the limitation on carbon emissions if the gasoline prices go up? What we ought to do is try to make sure that we minimize the cost of limit while at the same time we limit carbon emissions. Reclaiming the last one second, I assume the answer to that is no then. That's correct. Your time has expired as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, further discussion on this uh, amendment? Mr. Chairman. Uh, let, let me uh, see who wishes to speak on the amendment, because I think we've got a pretty clear idea of it. Uh, Mr. Gingrey, Gingri, you, you, I'm going to call on Mr. Upton first, because he's senior to you. So the two of you, and then I would like to then put uh, the uh, matter to a vote. Uh, Mr. Upton first. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I may not use all my five minutes, so if someone on our side uh, wants a little time, perhaps that'll that'll happen. I, I guess it, it comes down to this: the the frustration that I share with 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 Mr. Rogers, uh, and really with Mr. Dingle, and Mr. Stupak too. Our our state is really hard hit, and as I look at our region, the reliance on coal, the reliance on the auto industry, the jobs that we lost, uh, particularly in Indiana, that we share that same thing, uh, Ohio. Illinois, we are in real trouble. And with all the hearings that we had over the, the course of the, the first couple months of this year, 
<coughs> kept hearing that there's really no economic harm, little or no pain. Uh, this was going to be a good thing for the consumers, and it might be as little as uh, even less than a postage stamp in terms of the additional costs. And we'll accept that if it's true. But if it's not true, we want an insurance policy. We want an off-ramp is what it's called. And that's why Mr. Rogers offered the amendment that he did. China and India, if they don't comply, just like, just like the EU, they want, us to they want us to come up with the same scheme so they don't lose jobs over here. So we, we had that debate for a long time, and it failed. But tomorrow we'll come back to it again, because I, I, I have one of the amendments that's going to be filed is that they don't comply within five years. It'll be lifted. We'll get the off-ramp. We had a long discussion on Mr. Blunt's amendment. 10 per 10 increase in electric costs. We are told in parts of our district, parts of our region, electric costs may go up by 40 or 50 percent almost overnight. That amendment failed, but tomorrow we'll have another amendment along the same lines. Maybe it'll be 50 percent. And if that fails, maybe it'll be 100 percent. We're going to find out where that bar is. I'm going to have an amendment maybe later tonight if we have time to cap it at 10 percent unemployment based on this bill. I can tell you that in most of my counties, we wish we had 10 percent unemployment because we're way over that. And so is Michigan. And that's where our fear is. Now, last year, uh, we had a big debate on oil prices. And I supported Mr. Stupak's amendment on price gouging. Uh, we had a big bill back in 05. It was a bipartisan bill led by Mr. Barton with Mr. Dingle's support. And when that bill got to the floor, we had dozens and dozens of amendments. And there was one amendment that was defeated that would have provided incentives for more refineries in this country. One of our concerns, knowing that the price of oil is driven by supply and demand, is that we have both, that we can use the OCS, the Outer Continental Shelf, that we can have additional uh, 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 conservation efforts, that we can look at new sources of oil, whether it be tar sands or oil shale, coal to liquid, a whole number of different things. And we also have the refinery ca uh, capability. It wasn't always that we had to report to import refined oil. We do today. And one of our concerns is because of some of these requirements that are in this bill that we're going to send some of these refineries away from our shores. They're not going to be in Mr. Green's district. They're going to be in some other country. And what happens then if it increases cost as a result of this bill to more than $5? We're going we're gonna to make some changes. So, again, this, this bill, this amendment follows the same line as the other amendments. We're going to find out where that bar is. And if it's not $5, it's is it going to be 7 <laughs> Is it going to be 8 At what point do we tell American consumers enough is enough? I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Mr. Gingrey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and actually, my, my comments are very, very uh, closely aligned with the gentleman uh, from Michigan. And, and the point is, okay. at what point would, would you agree, would the majority agree, uh, to sunset this plan, at least, uh, as the uh, ranking member said, Title III of the plan? Uh, is it, is it, if it's not a 10 percent increase in uh, electricity prices for the average American, is it 25 percent? Uh, if, it, if it's not China and India uh, cutting down on their carbon footprint uh, and pollution as much as we do, is it 50 percent uh, of what we require of ourselves, or even 25 percent? At what point do we reach that sunset? And I agree fully with, uh, with w w Representative. Would the gentleman uh, yield? The gentleman yield for a uh, question? I, I will. I, I'll, I'll yield in just a few minutes, Mr. Weiner. Let me let me make my point. Uh, we, when I, w when the Democrat majority uh, occurred and, uh, and and Ms. Pelosi became Speaker uh, in January of 2007, uh, she was the first witness before the Science Committee. Uh, a witness of one. Uh, we were not really, we on the minority side were not permitted to ask her any questions. Uh, and her signature issue clearly uh, was this cap and trade and, and global warming issue. Uh, several weeks later, uh, former Pre Vice President Gore presented 
before the Energy and Commerce and Science Committee a joint, a joint hearing as a, as a witness of one uh, shortly after receiving the uh, Inconvenient Truth uh, uh, Documentary uh, Oscar Award. And it was the same thing, and it was clear, and it's clear to me today as I listened to comments from uh, Mr. Markey a few minutes ago when we talked about uh, the price of uh, gasoline, average price of the pump, getting up to $5, and, and, and his remark was, well, that's the whole point. You know, that's what, uh, it was almost like he was saying that's what we wish for uh, because at any cost, uh, we're going to a green technology uh, and we're not going to we're not going to use any fossil fuel, uh, and I think that is ridiculous. Uh, uh, Ranking Member Barton made the comment that, well, ha how how much destruction are you going to accept in this economy? How many bankruptcies of how many industries before you throw up your hands and say this is not working? And there has to be a point at which we are willing to look at that. And I'm not seeing that here. It's almost like. Uh, we're going full speed ahead no matter what the devastating effect on the economy might be. The hell with that. Uh, we've made up our mind. It's going to be a green economy and green jobs. I call them subprime jobs. And we're not going to, we're going to wean ourselves off fossil fuel no matter what. And oh, by the way, we're not going to allow any drilling off the outer continental shelf. Uh, we're not going to utilize shale uh, because it causes one scintilla uh, increase in carbon dioxide footprint. Uh, this is crazy, uh, and I think that this is the whole, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, the whole viewpoint from this side of the aisle. Uh, we, 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 there's some good ideas. We need an all of the above energy policy, but not green at any cost to the total exclusion of, of any fossil fuel. And with that, I will yield to my friend from New York. I, I thank the gentleman from Georgia. I think the problem is we have different ways of calculating the cost. I, would the gentleman agree that the present amount of money that we American citizens are pumping into the pockets of Ahmadinejad in Iran is unsustainable? Would you agree that our support of the Saudis by our dependence on fossil fuel is unsustainable? At what point does that reach so high that you say, I'm going to vote yes on this bill? Re reclaiming my uh, time, uh, uh, Mr. Weiner, I, I, I do agree with that. I do agree with that. And, and we can solve that. Uh, by the all of the above energy policy that we talked about for a full month, the month of August last year, uh, while maybe a lot of people were on vacation. Will the gentleman yield to a question? I I'll be glad to yield. Do you personally, you yourself, have a copy of that amendment? The, the, the all of the above plan? Uh, the all above plan, I, we, I, I absolutely do. Would, would, would you mind if I, I won't share it with anybody, would you mind if I see it? I, I'd like to see that. I, I mean, let's, let's, let's bring it up here. Let's have a discussion of it, because right now it seems like a fairly ad re, re, Reclaiming my time, I think, Mr. Would, Weiner, you will have an opportunity, and I'll, and I'll yield to the uh, ranking member. Well, let me, we need to be honest here. Um, we're not under oath, but I think it pays to be honest. The Republican alternative that I introduced last week has the all of the above in it, but, but that particular the production incentive package is not germane to this committee. And so the, the Republican alternative that we will bring to the desk sometime tomorrow or Thursday, depending on how the markup goes, will not have that in it unless the chairman is willing to rule that it's germane to the markup. Because if, if we brought it up, with non-germane amendments, the entire alternative could be ruled out of order. I'm just being honest. We've got it. It's been introduced. But the Republican alternative that we're going to put at the table will not have that in it because our production incentive stuff is not in the jurisdiction of this. Would, 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 would the gentleman yield, or, or can I strike the last well, one? Well, my time, I'll reclaim, but my time has expired. And but we're very, back. we'll share it. I can gentleman, share it with you. Gentlemen, gentleman uh, will give, be given an additional one minute so you can... I, I just, I, I guess the reason I raise it is we've now had repeated attempts at basically the same amendment with some variations of what triggers the bill being stopped. And in, in several occasions, this alternative has been referenced. It might be instructive for us to begin that discussion. Let's see what the alternative is and we'll have a discussion of the alternatives. At least that is moving what you seem eager to talk about onto the playing field so we can consider it. Germaneness non-germaneous, it's what you're going to eventually offer, I think now might be a constructive way to move forward. 
we've basically seen the outcome. We, the, 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 the votes are pretty clear on this thing. You've made the point, but you've referenced this, all of the above. Let's bring it. Let's take a look at it. Maybe you'll win some Democratic votes, and we can start amending that as the base bill. Time is up. I don't know how you Now do. we'll proceed to a vote on the, um, whose amendment? Mr. Terry's amendment. All, all those in <coughs> well, I think we, I think we've completed the discussion, and I've asked members to respond who wanted to speak on this, and if I, I I don't I'd certainly be happy to have you have two more minutes, but I don't want that to be used as an excuse for another round here. No, no, I understand. Well, without objection. All right. Mr. Without objection, the gentleman will be recognized for two minutes, and we will then proceed to the vote on the pending amendment. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and uh, I appreciate you. That'll be the order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you remember when Secretary Chu came here to testify, and uh, <coughs> I asked him this question. I said, uh, Mr. Secretary, last September you made a statement that somehow we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to the levels in Europe. Well, at that point, the levels in Europe were $8 a gallon. So when I hear this debate, I'm reminded that the Secretary of Energy agrees with you on your side that even if the cost of gasoline goes to $8 a gallon, this will be good because this will force Americans to cut back on gasoline. And I don't know how they're going to survive because your bill does not have the diversification and the transition so that these people can make it. Well, as it went further in this debate, the Secretary went on to talk about how economic climate would change and it would be completely unwise to increase the price of gasoline, he admitted. But he'd like to reduce the uh, price of gasoline, but he says it could go up. And he mentioned alternative fuels, forms of fuels, biofuels, that can lead to separate source or independent source of transportation. So I pressed him a little bit and I said, well, you don't really, honestly, in your heart of hearts, think that the American people will be satisfied with $8 a gallon. And he said, well, honestly, no, I don't think so. But I pressed him further and I said, well, don't you think it's really silly for you to even talk about that huge amount of expenditure here in America to follow with Europe? And he said, yes, I do. So I think my point is, Mr. Chairman, the Secretary of Energy at one time thought $8 a gallon. We're talking about $5 a gallon. And I'm saying from this perspective, if it's not just your members, Mr. Chairman, it seems to be the administration has the concept that it's okay to go to $8 a gallon to force Americans to somehow sacrifice. So with that in mind, I, I sort of uh, substantiate some of the statements we're si saying on this side, which we're repeating again and again, which is basically, you folks don't seem to care how expensive gasoline gets because in the end, you think it's all going to be solved by solar cells and wind, and you don't even recognize there has to be even a bridge or transition. So I think in that respect, Mr. Chairman, I think the point's uh, well made. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now proceed to a roll call vote on the pending amendment. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingell. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher, no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Ms. Deget. <coughs> Ms. Deget. Ms. Deget votes no. Yes. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes no. Mr. Doyle. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. No. 
Mr. Milan, Mr. Milan, Mr. votes aye. <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattig. Mr. Shattig, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes aye. <clears throat> Any other members wish to be recorded? Any member wish to change his or her vote? Any Republican wish to change his or her vote? <laughs> How about the Democratic side? If not, the clerk will tally the, uh, the vote. <clears throat> On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the ayes were 25 and the nays were 31. 25 ayes, 31 noes. The amendment's not agreed to. Okay. Now to go to the Democratic side, the Mr. gentleman Chairman, from I, the Virgin Islands. Can I have a parliamentary inquiry before we do that? And it'll be brief. Yes. If, Mr. Weiner asked that we introduce the uh, production incentive portion of the Republican alternative. I've asked my staff if that's easily separatable and it is it's about 80 to 100 pages um, if if it were to be introduced tomorrow clearly it's not germane but would the chairman be willing to allow it to be introduced and debated with the understanding that we withdrawn at the after the debate uh, the chair would want to have further discussions with you about the process because we have been here a very long day and have not made a lot of progress so 
Uh, there's a possibility. I'm not saying yes and I'm not saying no. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady from the Virgin Islands seek uh, recognition to offer an amendment. And as I understand it, this amendment is to this title and it has been submitted in advance. Uh, could you turn on your mic? I'd like to reserve a point of order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, gentleman from Louisiana reserves a point of order. Ms. Christensen, is, uh, you, uh, you wish to offer this amendment? The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2454 offered by Mrs. Christensen of the Virgin Islands. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and the gentlelady is recognized to explain her amendment. I, I, we, we, I can't hear you. Uh, is your mic out too? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to know. Yep. I hear something there. I think we found one. Yeah, good. Great. Well, I'm offering this amendment because of the heavy dependence of the territories on diesel and our inability to have made any meaningful reduction in the admissions, emissions from it because of our limited resources to do so. Reducing emissions from diesel engines is one of the most important air quality challenges, not only in the territories, but in the United States. Most, if not all, of the territory's heavy machinery and school and other buses are operated by diesel engines that don't fully meet EPA's clean diesel standards. We could have done more to reduce these emissions if we had access to the diesel emission reduction grants and loans that were authorized in the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Extension of the diesel emission reduction provisions to the offshore er areas, as we are seeking to do with this amendment, will not only help advance uh, current commitments to reduce air pollution, but will make great strides to protect our community's health and that of future generations. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank um, Congressman Sablan, not of this committee, from the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas for his strong advocacy on this issue, and I ask my colleagues to support this amendment. The gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. I yield time. back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barton. I, I rise um, in neutrality right now on the bill, on this amendment, excuse me. And I have a question for the gentlelady. The staff on the minority side has been looking for several hours. We can't find a Section 791-9 of the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Hmm. Could, could the council or the author of the amendment define for us where Section 791-9 is and in, in what act? Because it, it, it does not appear to be in the Energy Policy Act of 2005. It was added by Public Law 110-255 Section 3, subsection A. And what, what, it, it, what, what law is that? Because it's, it's, uh, not, it's not as it's referenced in this amendment. It, it, it's an act called be it, uh, to authorize the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to accept as part of a settlement diesel emission reduction supplemental environmental projects and for other purposes. And this public law amended uh, what was enacted in EPACT 05. And, and well, I would ask that the gentlelady withdraw the amendment so that we get it clarified what we're talking about. We'll accept it once, once it's correctly cited. I'm Gentlemen, yield to me. I'd be happy to. Why don't you accept it and then we'll make sure that uh, the code sections and all of that are correct. If you don't have a disagreement with policy and if we have a problem and you want to come back to the committee, we can come back and revisit it. I'll accept that with the chairman's understanding that before, if and when this bill gets out of committee, we'll, we'll fix it. And we're not opposed to the policy. I think she's just trying to make sure yeah. that... The territories are included. With, yeah. with, with that understanding, I'd ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read uh, subject to further discussions uh, on on the 
on the language and the structure of the amendment to be sure it meets with the um, concerns Te that members may Technical have. citations. Technical citations. Then we'll, we, we'll support the amendment. Mr. With Chairman. That. Who seeks recognition? D down here. Uh, yes. Just to speak in support of the amendment. Well, I, I, I ask unanimous consent the amendment be accepted. Do you, do you want to speak on it anyway? Yeah, just briefly. I, well, the gentleman's recognized. How brief? Uh, I'll, for me, it'll be very brief. <laughs> no longer five. Well, we'll have to yield. I'm speaking in support. You might want me to take the whole five minutes since I haven't been supportive of anything else. Gentleman's recognized. I, I just want to applaud the general lady. Uh, during one of the uh, markups, I went to the Diesel Technology Forum. Uh, Congresswoman Matsui and I are the authors of the DERA Act. It's been very, very successful in cleaning up diesel emissions. Uh, I, I applaud this move to make sure other partisan entities of, the, of, of our country fall into it, and, and I applaud the gentlelady, and I just want to extol the virtues of that piece of legislation which we passed, and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back the time. All those in favor of the Christensen Amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the uh, amendment's agreed to. Um, <laughs> We'll now go to the Republican side. Gentleman from Michigan seeks recognition Chairman, for what purpose? Uh, I have an amendment at the desk, and it seems like it was put there two days ago, but it was uh, sometime this morning. <laughs> it's relevant to this title, uh, relating to unemployment numbers. Uh, well, 10 I don't know. Do will the clerk that? inform us whether this amendment has been it, it presented has. in a timely fashion? Uh, it will, has, Mr. Chairman. Will you please uh, report the amendment? Amendment to H.R. 2454 offered by Mr. Upton. After Section 2, I would ask insert the following. To be considered as Without read. objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman and I'm going to ask another unanimous consent agreement. So if you listen to this carefully, uh, the amendment says 10 percent that the, uh, uh, the bill will be uh, like we've done before, that the average unemployment rate for the prior year, if it reaches 10 percent, um, it shall cease to be uh, effective. And I'm going to ask unanimous consent that that number 10 percent, where is it? But you want to change it, it to add be, those words. I'm going to, I'm going to try to say, this is not the right amendment, the one that they That's did. Right I'm sorry. The amendment that they passed out is not. You want to do that one? It says Upton at the top. Yeah, this isn't the right one. You'd rather like this one better? No, I like mine that I was going to introduce. Why don't we, why don't we report whichever one they'll accept? <laughs> you want to accept this one? No, it's <laughs> it says Upton on the top. As our clerk uh, identified the amendment that Mr. Upton really, really wanted to offer. It has an off-ramp at 10 percent nationally. That's not this one. Been there since this morning. Are you talking about the Midwest? Are you talking about the national national unemployment rate of ten percent? Oh, and it has up and on it, and it's at the desk. And it's been at the desk for two hours. Could we have our clerk take the amendment from you briefly, just to? Compare because we have you like. Have, do you have it? Maybe uh, maybe uh, for the for the moment, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield to another member to ask for an amendment. I'll come back in the queue just to save some time. Okay, um, Mr. Space, are you ready with your amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman. You wish to be recognized on it. I presume it's an amendment. May I presume it's an amendment that uh, fits to this title? You may. And is it one that's been at the desk for more than two hours? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Who would we recognize? <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, before you speak, let's get the amendment reported, see if we can do that and have it distributed. This one also says up to the top. Mitch. 
Mitch. Which one is this? Okay. Uh, we're, we're having the amendment distributed. Would the clerk uh, report the amendment? Amendment to the amendment in the nature of substitute offered by Mr. Space. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman from Ohio will be recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment uh, is designed to expand the opportunities uh, to deploy carbon capture and sequestration technology on existing coal-fired power plants. Uh, the bill itself provides uh, generous incentives for companies to engage in uh, aggressive uh, CCS technology uh, in the way of an uh, allowance bonus. And uh, while we are very happy to see that provision in the bill, we, we feel that it does not uh, adequately account for existing uh, large generators who wish to retrofit uh, their facilities to uh, provide for partial uh, CCS uh, technology in the output of electricity. Uh, this amendment is designed simply to uh, reward those uh, electrical generators that do engage in CCS uh, with bonus allowances uh, for retrofitting uh, existing facilities. Uh, we think that that is the most feasible and uh, practical way to ensure rapid uh, deployment, uh, development of this new technology. And uh, as far as we can see, uh, it is perfectly in line with the uh, goals and intent of this legislation to move in the direction of uh, CCS uh, technology and, and the utilization of coal fire generation. Yield back. Yields back is time. Is there discussion on the amendment? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barton. I have several questions. We are not automatically opposed to it, and we predisposed to be supportive, but we want to make sure we understand it. And I can ask this of the author or the council. Is the, is the space amendment specific to one plant, or is it a generic amendment? It is a generic amendment, not specific to one plant. Not specific to one plant. And on page two of your amendment, in the uh, retrofit applications, in the paragraph number two, where you talk about a certain percentage of flue, flue gas no longer applies to flue gas, but the entire product, we don't understand that. Can you explain that? And, and I'll, I'll do my best to explain it, and then certainly uh, I'm willing to defer to counsel. Uh, so the, the basis of this amendment is to uh, uh, stay within the framework of the original bill in terms of the amounts of uh, electricity being generated that would be eligible for CCS uh, bonus allowances. Um, we have we've attempted to uh, remain consistent with the intent of the bill. That language is designed specifically for those retrofitted plants that are not generating all of their power through CCS technology. There's still the 200 megawatt limitation that exists in the original bill. So if you've got a 1,000 megawatt plant uh, that wants to retrofit and do 20 percent through CCS, this bill, this amendment permits that. It just factors in uh, all those ingredients uh, through in a consistent fashion throughout the amendment. Uh, this this uh, legislation is we have looked at this very carefully and and certainly. Uh, are mindful of concerns that members may have, but we see no uh, problem. We think this will encourage the development, encourage deployment, and if this technology is going to be developed, it's going to be developed in this fashion by existing plants that can do it at scale. Uh, they're going to be sequestering this carbon on site. Uh, there are a lot of reasons as to why they cannot, uh, and, and it's not practical to think that they would, uh, convert or retrofit the entire operation over to uh, CCS technology because of the integration between the CCS technology and the plant's operation. It's too risky. If there's a problem with the CCS, the whole plant shuts down. It requires massive amounts of real estate. It's essentially if a plant were to go uh, completely retrofitted to CCS, they would have to double the real estate. Many plants just don't have that option available. Uh, this legislation is designed to allow some of those plants to do it. We, we know of one plant down in uh, West Virginia, the Mountaineer plant. Uh, that right. has made a significant investment uh, in this uh, process. Uh, we think it would be a shame to penalize companies that you have been intend this curve. would apply to any existing coal-powered plant in the country. Any existing coal-fired plant in the country, 
it's very unlikely uh, that any small manufacturer, relatively small manufacturer of electricity would, in fact, uh, take advantage of this because if you don't have scrubbers, uh, it's impracticable uh, to expect uh, that CCS technology will be utilized and only the larger plants have scrubbers. So uh, really the threshold is at about 600 megawatts, so it's very unlikely uh, that this would be something. I don't see be. Mr. Boucher in the room, but he's the author of the CCS uh, bill that I'm a sponsor of and the language in our Republican alternative if not identical, is almost identical to, to his language. Is is Mr. Boucher comfortable with this? Do you know? Have you talked I, to him? I don't I wish to speak for him, but I, I do have information that he is comfortable with this language and supportive of the amendment. Okay. Gentlemen, you, uh, we've been informed that Mr. Boucher has had a chance to review this amendment as, and is supportive of it. Well, I have to admit, I'm a registered professional engineer but I'm not an expert in CCS technology, and I'm certainly not an expert in retrofitting of existing coal-fired power plants of one gigawatt cumulative generating capacity. But well, our, maybe Mr. Shimkus would like our new know. friend from Ohio certainly seems to understand it, and he seemed like a sincere young man. So I'm going to say we'll accept it. I thank the ranking member. Any further discussion, uh, Mr. Of Chairman? This amendment? Who seeks recognition? Chairman, I just want to ask a question to the author. The gentleman's recognized. Is it safe to say that uh, that what this amendment does is applying the same standards of new coal fire plants to retrofits? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, what it is doing, in a sense it is, it's, it's making those retrofits eligible for that bonus allowance uh, that would be available for, for new plants that go completely CCS, which we anticipate in the future. These are for early retrofits that, again, are fundamentally important to the development of the technology over the next four to five years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Are we ready for the question? All those in favor of the space amendment will say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Mr. Upton, are, are we ready? I, I am ready. You're uh, ready. Is the clerk ready with the Upton amendment? Mr. Chairman, I ask, I may ask that the, since the amendment is only two sentences long, I might ask that it, it be read. I'm going to have a, a unanimous consent to change the number from 10 to 15 percent, but I'll wait till it's read. Clerk just will report it, so we'll have it before us. <laughs> amendment to H.R. 2454 offered by, Ms. by Mr. Upton. After Section 2, insert the following new section and make the necessary conforming changes in the table of contents. Section without objection, it will be considered as read, and further without objection, the number 10 will be changed to number to the 15%. Number 15 percent. Yeah. Uh, without objection, that will be the order. And the gentleman from Michigan is recognized to speak on his amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as, as a number of us have said for much of the day, in our region of the country, there is not a bigger issue than unemployment, uh, particularly in my state, which has had the terrible distinction of having the highest unemployment rate in the country for some time. We've been, we've been told that this uh, legislation has little or no economic harm, uh, that it, allocations have been made to cushion the blow. But in Remarks that John Engler made this last week, the head of the National Association of Manufacturers, he said that the enactment of this bill could possibly lead to a permanent recession. In Michigan, a study was done by the NAM, and they said that the primary cause of job losses in Michigan would be lower industrial output due to higher energy prices, the high cost of compliance and greater competition from overseas manufacturers, with lower energy costs. 
impact on energy prices, it said most energy prices would rise under the proposal, particularly for coal, oil, and natural gas. Manufacturers would be especially hard hit as they consume one-third of all energy in the U.S. Higher utility bills and gasoline prices would take their toll on Michigan's economy and would impose the heaviest financial burden on low-income households. State budgets would be adversely affected. Our former committee colleague, Sherrod Brown, now a senator from Ohio, who opposed cap-and-trade last June on the Senate floor, said that the President's plan, President Obama's plan, would lead to an increase in energy costs and would drive American firms abroad. And he said this, it really does say to manufacturing, go to China where they have weaker environmental standard and that's a very bad message in bad economic times, in any economic times, end quote. Job losses in my state this year may reach 239,000. So what this amendment does in order to save some time, we moved it from 10 to 15 percent. I appreciate uh, the, the chairman's uh, unanimous consent agreement that if, if the nation's unemployment rate reaches 15 percent because of this act, we will suspend uh, the bill, which is pretty much what we've tried to do with the other provisions that have not received a majority of votes for much of the day, whether it be increase in energy costs, uh, whether it be increases in utility costs, whether it be other countries, uh, particularly the other large emitters, whether they comply or not, we're saying, in essence, that if this bill increases unemployment up to 15 percent, a number that none of us want to ever see in our state or certainly in our country, because of this bill, there's going to be an off-ramp and it will, at that point, be suspended. So I would ask my colleagues to support that and at this point I would yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Who seeks recognition on the amendment? Uh, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess we may have some questions about the drafting of it. Uh, and I'm reading, I'm glad it's a short amendment. If the, in the last sentence, if the administration, this administrator determines in cons consult consultation with the Department of Labor that the unemployment rate for the prior year meets or exceeds 15 percent by unanimous consent, as a result of the implementation of this act, the Provisions Act shall cease to be effective. 15 percent as a result of this act. So right. we're at eight and a half percent now, maybe nine. They would have to determine that the increase was because of this bill okay. versus. I'm just thinking out loud that if this act caused 15 percent unemployment on our nine percent now, we'd be at 24 percent, which is depression era. I think we would see a new Congress <laughs> if that determination is made, whether you have, we have this amendment or not. Glad to have the gentleman's you support. You broke the code. And I think that's Chairman the, Barton. Would you like to respond to that? Well, <laughs> I can't imagine that happening. I'll I, <laughs> reclaim my time. Um, I can imagine. That's my concern about, uh, I guess, a lot of these amendments. This it, bill. I, I would make Mr. Point Upton, Mr. Upton, yeah, uh, if I'm you sorry. want him to yield to you, ask him to yeah, yield. Sorry. Okay. With the gentleman, the gentleman, my argument, Fred, and I'll yield Texas to you. With, time. I got plenty of time. Um, I guess my concern with a number of these amendments is that over the next few years, this bill has some benchmarks that we're going to get to. At any time during the next 10 years even, Congress could revisit this. And if we see anywhere near the, the, the horror stories of $5 a gallon gas or 15 percent unemployment based on this bill, I think Congress uh, would be derelict if they didn't revisit no matter who's in charge. And so that's why I think some of these amendments are sound good on politics, but in actually reality, it's, it doesn't make much sense. Because if to your bill, we would have to get, if we went to 10 percent unemployment right now, which is terrible, I think eight and a half is bad, and 15 percent on top of that, it would be literally 1933, and uh, 
there was a new Congress in 1932 <laughs> because of the policies of uh, in trying to deal with the Depression. With that, I'll be glad to yield, Fred. I, the, the intent of this is that it will be 15 percent total, not 15 on top of the, Nash, of the uh, current rate of nine. Well, the way I read it, it says 15 percent as a result of the implementation of this act. I think if you read it, and I don't know, we may ask the staff uh, for their interpretation, but uh, I think you, that's what the bill but, the, but the it amendment says, says. If the gentleman yields, it says that the employment, employment rate for the prior year meet or meets or exceeds 15 percent. It doesn't say. As a result of the implementation of this act. And I think that's why yeah. I'm reading yeah, the, 15 percent, yeah. or if it's 15 percent, then 8.5 percent of what we have right now, which hopefully we will lower over the next few months. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's why I oppose the amendment, and I yield back my time. Further discussion of the amendment? Mr. Shimkus, do you seek recognition? Yes, Mr. Chairman, speak in support of the amendment. Thank you. I, I guess what we're trying to find out is if we're going to make benchmarks for carbon emissions out to 2050, why can't we accept one amendment on job losses? Why can't we accept one amendment on energy cost increase? If we're going to have all these benchmarks, as my colleague from Texas said, we got all these benchmarks, why don't we have one benchmark for the, the rate payer? Why don't we have one benchmark for the employed or unemployed worker? Why don't, why don't we have just one benchmark that says, by golly, if costs increase, we're going to take care of the little guy. We've got benchmarks again for the, the corporate titans who went behind the closed doors to cut these deals. We've got benchmarks for them out to 2050. We don't have a single benchmark for the single individual rate payer. Nor do we have a single benchmark to protect for job loss. Not one. This goes back to the other debates. Who's sticking up for the little guy? The individual in rural America who has to drive long distances. Who's sticking up for the guy who's going to lose their job? We've had Dr. Gabriel Calzada Alvarez from Spain. He talked to us and said, America, are you crazy? We've got 17.5% unemployment in Spain. And you want to model your, your aspects after us? You've got to be kidding me. For every one green job, we've lost 2.2 regular jobs. That's why, that's why this debate is so crazy. All these benchmarks for caps throughout the ages, no benchmark for the little guy, no benchmark for the rate payer. More, more gas price increases, more job losses. You guys don't want to protect them. We're giving you chances to vote. You won't, you won't take us up on it. No, it's, it's not going to affect them. It is going to affect them. We're betting that it will. Why don't you just accept one of these amendments? 15%? Fred could have stayed with 10. Fred, I would ask you to move it to 23%. We're trying to figure out how much job loss can we put in a benchmark for you all over on the other side. 50%? 60 percent? Is there any benchmark for the worker that we can put in this bill? Is there any increase in electricity rates that we can put in this bill that you would accept? Anybody? No takers? Yield, yield to me. I would yield to you, Mr. There Chairman. is no, no benchmark that you could say has only one solution, and that's the elimination of the law. There ought to be other thoughts as how we can deal with this problem. Your only solution to any benchmark is to have the law evaporate. That is not thoughtful. If I were claiming my time, Mr. Chairman, the, the amendment says if these job losses are a result of this act directly, and you know, Gentlemen, we've got an administration that supports cap and trade. We'll have Department of Labor folks who will be in your camp. If they say we've lost 15 percent to 23 percent unemployment, then then they're pointing out the fallacies of this bill. But you guys won't even accept an analysis. Why don't you counter with an amendment that says we will at least look at it if unemployment reaches 
You're not even accepting the premise that there's, you do accept the premise that there's going to be energy increases because you've got a portion of this bill to mitigate the increase. You've, you've given out these caps to try to mitigate the effects of increased costs. All we're saying is let's have a benchmark for the little guy, Gentlemen, not the guys who went into the back room who cut these deals, not the CEOs. How about the little guy? Would the gentleman yield? No, I will not yield right now. Because what I would like to get a premise is that my colleague from Texas says we've got these benchmarks. I think that's real telling. We've got benchmarks for everybody but the person who's going to pay the fare. We bring up electricity increases. We bring up gas increases. We, we, we bring up job losses. But y'all don't seem to want to address the issue that faces the poor in this country. And I'm sorry about that. Thomas, time has expired. Mr. Sarbanes. No. How's that? Yes. Um, I'd oppose this amendment. The, the other side is taking uh, down and it's making it up and it's taking up and it's, it's turning it down. And here's what I mean. The benchmarks that you keep talking about, our premise is that if we don't do this bill, we're going to hit these high gas prices again because the only way we're going to reduce our dependence on oil is to move in a different direction. And that was the experience of last year. So we look at these numbers you pose, and for us it's a reason to redouble our commitment to this bill because we believe, and we think the evidence demonstrates, that if we don't commit to what's in this bill, we're going to be back again at those high gas prices. If we don't commit to what's in this bill, we're not going to create the millions of jobs that this bill has the potential to create. We're not going to create those new economies, this new clean economy, clean energy economy. That's what the little guy wants. They want jobs. This is what they want. This is a jobs bill first and foremost. It's a job that will create fuel efficiency and fuel economy so that the person who needs to get in their car and drive great distances, as we heard about before from Mr. Rogers, can do that at less expense. So this is exactly designed for the little guy. And I think that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure I quite understand the way the, these, this bundle of amendments has been drafted, whether it's what Mr. Green surmise that when you're talking about 15 percent unemployment, um, you're putting that on top of the current unemployment rate. And so you're talking about 25 percent, in which case I think he's right, the world turns upside down and it becomes meaningless. Or whether it's what I interpret it to be, which is you're saying the point at which we go over 15 percent, then your provision would take effect or the point at which gas prices go over $5 per gallon, your provision would take effect. But if that's the case, it could be that the unemployment rate got to 14.99% for reasons wholly unconnected uh, to this bill. And somebody determined that based on this bill, it kicked it over to the 15% the, the threshold, and then suddenly we'd scrap the whole bill. Or the gas prices would get up to $4.99 per gallon for reasons wholly unconnected to this bill. But that 2 percent push that the economists have concluded is the only marginal impact that this will have on gas prices at the pump would push you to $5.01 and then have the triggering effect of completely eliminating uh, this program and this bill. So I think it's, it's not drafted very wisely from that standpoint. None of these amendments are to the extent they're going to get rid of this commitment. 
which is all about reducing gas prices over time because you have alternative sources of energy and making sure that the jobless rate comes down because you're creating these new economies. And so for those reasons, I would oppose this amendment just the way I oppose the other amendment. And I, I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back his time, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do speak in favor of the amendment, and I'm glad that Mr. Upton brought this amendment forward because retaining jobs, creating jobs, are something that we are all very, very concerned about. And we are indeed concerned when we hear from other countries that, like the, the report from Spain that Mr. Shimkus referenced, that they have actually lost jobs. Now, as we have gone through this entire process over the last several months of looking at cap and trade and looking at the European trading scheme, I, I would like to just ask my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, do you have studies or access to studies that show that countries have actually grown, had a net increase in jobs after they implemented cap and trade? Because it seems that what we continue to hear is that you lose your manufacturing jobs, you lose your energy-based jobs. If it has to do with steel, if it has to do with cement, if it has to do with electric power generation, you're going to see jobs lost, a net jobs loss. So it is of tremendous concern to me that we are not hearing from the other side of the aisle that they want to put some, uh, some markers in here. They want to have, they are averse to having checks and balances to make certain that we don't end up with a piece of legislation that becomes a division of our federal government that is all of a sudden too big to fail and we can't go in here and have any checks and balances. We need to put that in place and we need to do it now. We don't need to delegate that <laughs> to some administrator of some administration or some secretary. This is something that we are tasked to do on behalf of our constituents. And our constituents are very, very skeptical of what the outcomes will be from this legislation. So I appreciate the gentleman's amendment and I yield back the balance of my time. Generally yields back the balance of her time. Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I oppose the amendment, and I'd, I'd like to say a, f a few things about why. Uh, first of all, if you read the bill, and um, you want, you're, because you're concerned about the little guy, uh, read about the 15% um, break for low and moderate um, uh, people that are in the bill. Um, this is a classic debate about the past versus the future. This is really about the New Deal in the 21st century. And I haven't heard one member use the following word, the children. What the hell kind of a future are any of our children or theirs going to have if we remain wedded and stuck to the past, to an oil past, and keep that as an oil future. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable, and we know that it's not. This bill does take our country in a new direction, and that may be frightening to some, but it's far more frightening not to understand that we have to change that we have to shape our future and America's destiny. Because if we don't, our children are really doomed. Our children will be doomed. They will not be able to sustain what you all want them to inherit based on your debate tonight. I respect your thinking. I don't agree with it, but I respect you. I respect you. But, but I think with all due respect uh, uh, to you, uh, that you're on the wrong side of history here. You're on the wrong side of history. My children think we've done a lousy job in terms of what they've inherited so far. So each title of this bill 
is a step into the future. And I think that we need to be bold because the situation calls for it. But, uh, I mean, you know, all this business about the little guy and clinging to the past, my God, uh, the average person in this country wants us to shape policies that are going to catapult us ahead. Today and the past are not good enough for them anymore. So uh, I thank my colleagues on the other side of the aisle for, for their sincerity. Uh, but boy, is there a difference in the way we think. And I think the debate, not only around this amendment, but others, uh, are highly instructive. And uh, I well, think I've uh, lady, well, I'm glad to yield. I'm glad to yield to Mr. Yield. Markey. You know, this is very consistent with what has happened since January 20th in the inauguration of President Obama. Uh, there was near, un near uniform Republican opposition to his job stimulus plan, a very negative characterization of it that was made, um, even though it was obvious that it had lifted the hopes of the American people uh, and given some real sense uh, that there was a way out of this economic morass that the preceding eight years had uh, unfortunately put our country into. Here we know that much of what we're suffering from is our excessive dependence upon imported oil. What we're trying to do is to put in place a plan with some predictability that will elicit massive amounts, some economists believe upwards of a trillion dollars of private sector investment uh, into this sector uh, that will create millions of new jobs. Uh, but instead of embracing that, uh, th it is clear uh, that like the near uniform opposition to the President's stimulus plan, they intend on taking the same tact here, and I'm sure they will in other economic uh, policy uh, areas before this year is done. And that is their right. But it's a very pessimistic view of the future. It almost guarantees that we wind up with $5 a gallon gasoline. It almost guarantees that we wind up with very high unemployment uh, because we either have a choice here of, uh, of uh, reenactment, which it's clear is going to be uh, the case uh, on this bill as it was on the stimulus bill, or it's reconciling to the dilemma which we have in this country and carving out a new path, uh, a predictable path that can unleash private sector investment in this sector as it did in the telecommunications sector after the 1996 telecommunications. Will gentlemen sector. yield? Uh, that is, unfortunately, the choice which is being made. I thank the gentle lady for uh, yielding to me, and uh, and I yield back the balance of the time. Will the gentle lady yield? Chairman. Time has expired, Mr. Barton. Mr. Chairman, I, Mr. Chairman, thank you for recognizing me. I speak in su support of the of this amendment, and I want to uh, state the reasons why. First, I want to bring members' attention to page 420 of the chairman's uh, substitute, where it talks about the uh, mission allowances by calendar year. Beginning in 2012, for the U.S. economy, the cap is 4,627 million metric tons, and that increases in 2000. And 14 by about 400 tons, increases a little bit more in 2016. I assume those are the refinery allowances that, that Mr. Green and Mr. Gonzalez have negotiated. Then it begins to decline, and it eventually, in the year 1000, in the year 2050, declines to, um, to, to 1,035. Now, the best number that I have for the man-made CO2 emissions in the United States in the year 2005, which is the baseline year, was a little over 7,000, 7,200. So there's 2.6, I mean, 2,600 million metric tons of CO2 that's disappeared. I don't know if that's been given away. I don't know if it's in reserve. But it's, it's not in this bill. We, according to the press reports and according to Mr. some of the other, some of the gentlemen on your side, on the majority side that have spoken today, even with all of these allowances that are being given away, 
there's still at least 15 percent that are going to have to be auctioned beginning I, I assume in 2013 maybe 2014 now that's going to cost money the Heritage Foundation and there we've asked CBO to score this bill for the first five years um, hopefully that score will come out in the next day or so while this markup is still going on but the Heritage Foundation's quick analysis of the new bill that's now in play says in the year 2012, which is the first year you have a cap, the U.S. economy is going to lose almost 2 million jobs. And again, the Heritage Foundation says on average, every year, the U.S. economy is going to lose 844,000 jobs almost two million the first year and a little under a million every year every year now they may be right they may be wrong they may be off 50 percent either way there may be other analysis that come out in the next few weeks we've only got three days apparently to mark the bill up this amendment the upton amendment is pretty straightforward it says if the unemployment rate exceeds 15 percent cumulatively you suspend the act now if it doesn't nothing happens if it does and he even added as a result of the implementation of this act and it's the obama secretary of energy i mean secretary of labor and the obama epa administrator that have to prepare the report to congress it's not the Bush administration, it's not the Reagan administration, it's not the Ford administration, it's the Obama administration. Now, at some point in time, the majority that supports this bill really needs to support one of these amendments. We've tried to protect our workers against jobs going to China and India. The majority has said no. We've tried to protect our workers against high gasoline prices. The majority has said no. We're now trying to protect our workers against generically losing their job because unemployment goes up to 15 percent. The majority should say yes to this one. There ought to be some cap. We, we're into this big cap and trade debate. Let's have some cap on how, how high unemployment can go to protect the worker. Now, these are union workers and non-union workers. These aren't Republican workers. These are every worker in America. If, and as somebody has pointed out, if 15 percent is not the right number, maybe it should be 20 percent. But there should be some number that the majority is willing to accept. I mean, we, we cannot have a, as, as a, you can't have it both ways. Either, either this thing is going to be hugely expensive and it, unemployment's going to go up and prices are going to up, go up or we're going to have this green revolution and and there's going to be peace and love and we all live in the garden of eden but you can't have it both ways we ought to vote for the upton amendment gentlemen's time has expired further debate if not let's go to the vote i think all the members have heard all the arguments for what purpose does the gentleman from louisiana mr scalise seek recognition do you want to pursue your point of order to speak on the amendment you wish to speak on the amendment. Who else wishes to speak on this amendment? Mr. Scalise will be recognized to speak on the amendment for five minutes, and then we'll proceed to the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with something called the rule of holes. What the rule of holes says is if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing you do is stop digging. And so what this amendment is trying to do is say, if we've determined that after looking at this cap and trade energy tax, watching the implementation and reviewing the effects, if all of these grandiose ideas of how many millions of jobs are going to be created don't pan out, if in fact we lose 15 percent more jobs in our country because of cap and trade, then the first thing we should do is stop doing cap and trade. Amendment doesn't take effect if they create all these millions of jobs we keep hearing about. Of course, in Spain, they heard that same argument. They heard how many wonderful jobs it's going to create. And after years of implementing cap and trade in Spain, they've now actually done a study. They're actually phasing it out because they realized for every one new job they created, they lost 2.2 jobs. 
And of those jobs they created, nine out of 10 of them were temporary. So in essence, for every one permanent job they created under cap and trade, they lost 20 permanent jobs in their regular section, in their regular economy. Now, according to this amendment, we would say if we lose 20 jobs for every one job we create, that's not the bill that they're telling us it is. It's not a bill that's creating millions of jobs. It's a bill that's running off millions of jobs. And then we should stop doing this because it didn't work the way that they said. Now, I know there are some people here that think that if a bunch of politicians in Washington say something, then it's going to happen. There are a whole lot of families out there that know a whole lot different. And if there's any question about whether the people that are actually bringing this bill, the supporters of the cap and trade energy uh, tax, look at their bill. 55 pages so far that I've read through of this bill, 55 pages are dedicated to job loss. They have 55 pages of this bill, and I'll, maybe I'll finish it by the end of tonight at the pace we're going, but I've already found 55 pages in this bill that deal with workers that will lose their jobs because of cap and trade. So clearly they're acknowledging that jobs will be lost. As they're saying here in committee, millions of jobs will be created. It's going to be wonderful. Well, if that's the case, why did they dedicate 55 pages in their own bill to job loss? And maybe the worst part of it is the last page. Go to page 818 of the bill. It said, the establishment of a waiting list for workers in the event that the requests for assistance exceed the spending limit. They're acknowledging that even after all that they plan on spending on unemployment that will be created by cap and trade, they still acknowledge they may not be able to take care of all of the unemployed workers. They might have to create a waiting list. So you want to talk about children. Look at the impact of this bill on children. When their parent goes home and says, hey, you know, the, those folks up in Washington, D.C., Congress had a brilliant idea to create millions of jobs for your generation. Problem is, they got it wrong. Imagine that. Congress may have, in about a five-day period, wrote a 1,000-page bill, major biggest overhaul of energy policy in our country's history in five days, and they actually got it wrong. And because of them getting it wrong, they dedicated 55 pages to me being unemployed. Now, do you think that kid feels good about that? <laughs> what about the guy that goes home and says, they dedicated 55 pages to me being unemployed, and I happen to get laid off later than everybody else, and now I'm on the waiting list. I don't even get help for being unemployed because of Congress's crazy actions, just like what they did in Spain. We don't have to look at reinventing the wheel. History shows you what can happen if you do something like this, and you don't look at the consequences. They've looked at the consequences and they've said, yeah, there's probably a real good chance a whole lot of people in this country will be laid off. And so they dedicated 55 pages to what happens to all of those people that lose their jobs. And all we're saying is, why don't we add that number up to 56 pages? We're just adding one more page to the 55 pages of how to deal with the unemployed people. But what we're saying is, for those unemployed people, don't create a waiting list for them. Don't create a bunch of government programs for all these people you're putting out of work. Stop putting them out of work. Just stop putting them out of work. Your great idea didn't work. Let's go to a real energy plan where we create good jobs, we become energy independent by using our own natural resources and using that to fund all of the alternative sources of energy, not running jobs off to all these other countries that you then need 55 pages to go and deal with the unemployment and the job losses that will come. So I would support the amendment and I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are we ready for the vote? Mr. Mr. Gingry, for what purpose do you seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, to speak on the amendment. A gentleman willing to speak the less, for less than five minutes, or do you need the full well, five Mr. minutes? Mr. Chairman, the gentleman is willing to speak for less than 45 seconds. Gentleman's recognized yeah. for? I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think the bottom line here is that we're, this side of the aisle is willing to accept a new deal. We just don't want a raw deal. Uh, and if we, if a new deal that starts in 1932 is not working by 1939, we want to have a chance to have a sunset and get the heck out of that raw deal. And that's what this is all about. That is, as all this amendment is all about, we want you to admit that there is a, a, a benchmark at which you would finally throw in the towel and say, this is not working, this is not a new deal, this is a raw deal for our children, our grandchildren, and let's go in another direction. And I yield back. Let's proceed to a vote on the Upton Amendment. All those in favor of the Upton Amendment say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it.
The noes have it. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a roll call vote. Okay, we'll proceed to a roll call vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. Ms. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, no. Ms. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. <laughs> Mr. But Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. <coughs> Ms. Bonomack. Ms. Bonomack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Melanson votes no. Mr. Ross? 
Mr. Ross votes no. Where's Ms. Brown? He's here? Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Barrow, I apologize. Votes no. They're coming for you guys. I hear them in the hallway. <laughs> Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Aye. I'm sorry. Mr. Mr. Barrow votes aye. I apologize. He heard him. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan votes aye. Have all members responded to the uh, call of the roll? Any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, we'll tally the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the yeas were 21, the nays were 34. 21 ayes, 34 noes, the amendment's not agreed to. Uh, Ms. Baldwin, for what purpose do you seek uh, recognition? Mr. Chairman, I would like to, I have uh, an amendment at the desk and would like to offer uh, actually four amendments on block in the interests of moving things forward. Um, so Four amendments. Are all these amendments uh, to this title? They are all, as I understand, all amendments to this title and all have been uh, at the uh, filed the requisite amount of time. May I announce which four they are? Yes, please. <laughs> all right. Baldwin, 55. Um, Inslee, 46. Um, Rush, uh, Low Income Energy Efficiency Grant Program. And Schakowsky, um, Office of Consumer Advocacy. Is there objection to offering these amendments in block? Hearing none, that will be the order. The clerk will report uh, each of the amendments. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Ms. Baldwin. On page 35. Without objection, that amendment will be considered as read. What is the next amendment? Amendment offered by Mr. Inslee of Washington. Without objection, that amendment will be considered as read. Amendment offered by Mr. Rush of Illinois. Without objection, that amendment will be considered as read. And an amendment in the to the amendment in nature of offered by Ms. Schakowsky of but Illinois. Without objection, that amendment will be considered as read. Ms. Baldwin, the uh, chair recognizes you for five minutes and uh, uh, and and you may then yield to the other authors of the... Uh, Mr. Well. Chairman, may we dispense until we get the amendments? There are four of them. I just ask okay. for a moment, please. Let's, let's have all the amendments distributed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. on the way. Chair recognizes the um, gentlelady from Michigan. 
Wisconsin. <laughs> Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The amendment that I am offering ensures that solar water heating and solar light pipe technology qualify as energy efficiency technologies when FERC prescribes standards and protocols for defining and measuring electri electricity savings under the new combined efficiency and renewable electricity standard. Solar light pipe technology is energy technology that displaces energy demand in a way that can be accurately verified. The Energy Independence and Security Act describes the energy derived from solar light uh, technology as direct solar renewable energy. These technologies present a relatively new and effective way to provide emissions-free energy. The light pipes, like the ones uh, constructed at Orion Energy Systems in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, use direct solar energy to illuminate the inside of buildings, thus eliminating the need for electrical light fixtures during many daylight hours. Re this results in maximizing available energy savings and significantly reducing carbon emissions, saving U.S. companies millions of dollars every year. Equally important, the construction and in installation of solar light pipe technology would support thousands of good paying jobs. By in, um, including solar light pipe technology and other direct solar renewable energy in the bill, countless companies will be provided an opportunity to utilize this technology. Um, with that, I would yield uh, time to uh, Mr. Inslee to discuss his amendment. Thank you. Uh, we have a small, uh, hopefully non-controversial amendment with the, which would authorize the National Bioenergy Partnership. This is an existing program, but it's never been authorized. Uh, these programs uh, essentially uh, are administered uh, by use of the governor's offices, state or nationally. They help the distribution of information both for development of technologies in bioenergy and for marketing. This is a wonderful little program that helps small businesses get up to scale in the development of bioenergy. That includes cellulosic feedstock research and development of low-carbon biofuels. It includes technical assistance for deployment of methane digesters and biogas generators and sustainability research on woody biomass harvesting and wood pellet fuels. It's a great program. It's limped along. This would authorize it and allow us to get it going on a more full-time and consistent basis. Thank you. I would now yield time to uh, uh, Mr. Rush to describe his amendment. <clears throat> Thank you, the gentlelady. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm, this uh, program, the Low Income Community Energy Efficiency Program, uh, is a vital program that authorizes the Secretary of Energy to make grants to private, nonprofit, mission driven community development organizations. These organizations may include community de development corporations and community development financial institutions that will provide financing to businesses and projects to improve energy efficiency. Additionally, this funding will help identify and develop alternative, and renewable, and distributed energy supplies provide technical assistance and promote job and business opportunity for low-income residents and, re and, in and increase energy conservation in low-income rural and urban communities. These grants will also provide capital to minority-owned and women-owned businesses and finance entrepreneurs looking to create jo new jobs, new technology, and economic development opportunities in communities that are far too often overlooked. Mr. Chairman, this program is vital and it brings capital uh, to communities that I represent. I yield back. I would now yield time to uh, Ms. Schakowsky to describe her amendment. This amendment um, really is for the little guy. It would establish an Office of Consumer Advocacy within the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, an office that would represent the interests of America's energy consumers. For too long, no one at the federal level has been watching for abusive rate hikes on consumers, particularly on senior citizens and small businesses. Most states already have established offices of consumer advocacy that stand up for the rate payer. Consumers have faced higher prices and limited, if any, choices. State consumer advocate offices have worked diligently to protect consumers. However, they have limited resources. In addition, because so much energy activity is interstate in nature and so much of the energy business has moved interstate, the state advocate offices are not sufficient. The office created by my amendment would collect data, investigate services and rates, monitor and review customer complaints, and represent customers before the commission in other proceedings. Also, it would publicly dissemin uh, disseminate information and issue reports and recommendations. In addition, 
The amendment would establish an advisory committee to that office that would review rates, services, and disputes and make recommendations. The committee would include state utility consumer advocates to ensure that consumers are protected at the state and federal level. The advisory committee would also include a non-governmental consumer advocate. A federal energy consumer advocate would be an independent watchdog over a variety of important issues that come before the FERC and before other agencies. This uh, amendment was uh, drafted in consultation with, uh, with FERC, so it doesn't duplicate any of its other services, and it will provide essential protection for consumers. I urge adoption of the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. Time has expired. Mr. Barton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm at the appropriate time, I'm going to move to divide the question. You've got four amendments that have been offered in block. We didn't object to that. But on review of the four amendments, uh, the minority is willing to accept the Rush Amendment and the Baldwin Amendment. And we think that, that they are uh, either meritorious or at least innocuous so that uh, we can accept them. But on the um, Inslee Amendment and the Schakowsky Amendment, um, the Inslee Amendment is authorization earmarking which I thought members on both sides of the aisle were opposed to. And the Schakowsky Amendment is duplicative uh, because 40 states already have uh, consumer advocates, and it is uh, very unclear how adding a national consumer advocate in the office of the uh, Federal Power Commission uh, would do anything but muck up the water. So, um, Will the gentleman yield to me? Be happy to yield. To Let me uh, put unanimous consent that the uh, uh, that the committee consider the uh, Rush and Rush and Baldwin amendments uh, in block uh, separately from the Inslee and Schakowsky amendment. And if uh, that's a, without objection, that'll be the order. And I'd like to now put the question for the Rush and Baldwin amendments. All those in favor of those two amendments, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendments, uh, the two amendments are agreed to. Now we have the Inslee and Schakowsky amendment uh, to I be considered th together. Do, do you wish to just speak against those amendments, or are you ready for the vote? Well, I have spoken against them. Okay. Uh, I'll yield back my time, but there may be other speakers who wish to speak any, against them. Any further s discussion of it? If not, yes. Ms. 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 Chairman, my, uh, my comments will be directed initially to uh, the Schakowsky amendment. And, and, and I'm trying to get this straight. We're going to set up a, a, a an office in the FERC that's designed to hear con consumer complaints against utilities that have raised rates because of this bill. That's that's what we're doing. We're we're setting up a office in the FERC to hear the little guy's complaints about the raised rates by the utilities who are passing on the rate increase because of the cap and tax bill. So we're going to go after the utilities for which we've charged this, and that's what this federal agency, and we've had a lot of talk about the public utility com commissions in the states, which are supposed to be doing that. And all throughout the day, you all said, don't worry. We've got the Public Utility Commission for the states there protecting the little guy, but now we have to have a federal office to do the same thing. And in, in reading the, the text of this, bring complaints on behalf, represent and appeal on behalf of energy customers on matters concerning rates or service of public utilities and natural gas companies under the jurisdiction of the commission. So we agree rates are going to go up. We agree there's going to be complaints. Now we're going to have a federal commission to go after the utilities who've raised rates because of this bill. Um, I oppose this amendment. I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Ms. Schakowsky? Well, I'd like to just uh, let the gentleman know what the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission does, among other things. Approves the siting and abandonment of interstate natural gas pipelines and storage facilities, ensures a safe operation and reliability of proposed and 
operating LNG terminals, ensures the reliability of high voltage interstate transmission systems, monitors and investigates energy markets, uses civil penalties and other means against energy organizations and individuals who violate FERC rules and energy markets. For example, the FERC was involved in the California electricity crisis investigating allegations of electricity market manipulation by Enron and other uh, energy companies. Um, so there's a wide variety of activities where those of you who have been um, look, wanting to look out for the little guy, we set up a uh, really a, a consumer advocacy office within the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission on all these matters, a place for the consumer to go when they have a problem with things that are under the jurisdiction of FERC, which are um, b beyond, uh, beyond rates, um, uh, but it could be about abusive uh, rate hikes on consumers. And we provide a place where we have special advocacy for the little guy. And I would say that uh, it's, it's completely in line with the arguments that you're making and something that you ought to, everyone ought to support. Thank you. And yield to me, will you? And I would like to uh, yield then to Mr. Inslee. I want to briefly respond to Mr. Barton's comment. He, he suggested that uh, the, the biofuels partnership amendment I've offered is somehow an earmark. I can't understand that argument. Uh, this is about as far as an earmark as you can get. This program it exists in all 50 states. It's administered uh, by the, uh, uh, largely by the Governor's Association. It will not go to any particular district. If I was going to do an earmark, it would go mostly to, to Mr. Doyle's district so I could perhaps get in a baseball game this year because he's a coach. Uh, so I just want to assure my comrades in arms that this is not an earmark. It's an authorization. We should pass it. Gentlemen, you? Certainly. What is um, the Pacific Regional Biomass Energy Partnership led by the Washington State University Energy Program, if that's not an authorization earmark? Well, that, that, program, that program basically serves essentially the whole country, and, and I will take a long well, time to explain earmark. this. Well, no, it is not because it's serving Washington the whole country. Washington State University Energy Program is not an authorization. Let me That's who's going to lead it. That's if you excuse me, let, let me let me answer your question. This bill, there are five centers of of partnerships. One is called CONEG. It serves Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Vermont. The second is the Council of Great Lakes Governors. It serves Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. The third is the Southern States Energy Board that serves Alaska, Ar excuse me, Alabama, Arkansas, District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia. I won't list the rest of them. The, West, the fourth is the Western Governors Association. It services Arizona, California, Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, Nevada, New Mexico, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Texas, Utah, and Wyoming. And the fifth is the Pacific Regional Biomass Energy Partnership led by the WSU, Washington State University Cougars Energy Program. It serves Alaska, Hawaii, Idaho, Oregon, Montana, and Washington. If this is an earmark, every single thing we've authorized, including the DOD budget that serves all 50 states, is an earmark. Come up with some good argument here. That is this an is argument. And then, then you should remove the names and set up a, a regional national bioenergy partnership and dictate the five regions of the country. You're earmarking. The gentlemen, ge the time is in the hands of Ms. Of Ms. Schakowsky. Do you wish to yield or yield back your time? Or, I know Mr. Sure. Blunt is seeking recognition. Without objection, the time will be yielded back, and Mr. Blunt is recognized. Mr. Chairman, we've heard all day how, how uh, people don't, we don't need to be worried about unemployment. We don't need to be worried about utility rates. We don't need to be worried about um, the residential utility rates. We don't need to be worried about gas. And now we find we've got to have a whole new regimen to be uh, be concerned about all of those things. But I'll, I'll yield the time to, the, to Mr. Barton. I, I just want to point out there may be one positive reason to put the Schakowsky Consumer Advocate at the FERC. The current chairman that's been appointed by uh, President Obama has publicly stated that he opposes any new nuclear power, any new coal-fired power generation, and that in his opinion, we can meet the electricity needs of America uh, purely by conservation. So perhaps we need a consumer advocate in the FERC to protect the, the country against the chairman of the FERC. That might be one reason to support this amendment. 
Gentlemen, yield back the time. Uh, why don't you yield to Mr. Shattigan? Line 17 through 19, on page 2, line 1 through 3, I'd like to ask counsel. Uh, it says that they may able, this office may bring complaints on behalf of, represent an appeal on behalf of energy customers on matters concerning rates or service of public utilities and natural gas companies under the jurisdiction of the Commission. I, my question of counsel is, does this mean that this office could bring a complaint on behalf of a customer who gets electricity from, for example, the Western Power Authority, which has uh, generation capacity in the Western United States uh, and which sells electricity throughout the Western United States and transmit that, transmits that over power lines in the Western United States uh, and I believe is under the jurisdiction of what is referred to here as the Commission, meaning FERC. Is that correct? I apologize. I was finding a copy of the amendment as you were citing the page and line numbers. Page 1, lines 17 through 19. Page 2, lines 1 through 3. Uh, who are the consumers on behalf of whom the office may bring these complaints and against whom may they be brought? Uh, the, this intended office would represent the consumers that the Natural Gas Act, the Federal, Federal Power Act, was enacted to protect. Um, as both those statutes have a fundamental purpose of consumer protection. Those are the consumers who are served by the regulated entities regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, under, those, under those statutes. And if they are already protected by the Arizona Corporation Commission or if they are already protected by the Residential Utility Consumers Organization in the state of Arizona, can is there anything in this act which stops them from bringing a duplicate consumer protection action uh, against those entities? This entity would only work in the proceedings conducted at FERC for FERC regulated entities um, and FERC does not have duplicate proceedings with the Arizona Public Service Commission or other state commissions regulating the state regulated utilities. Okay and then so then who are the consumers that this is referring to or the customers? It energy might customers. Well be, it might well be Arizona Public Service Company paying a wholesale rate for power that is under a FERC regulated wholesale tariff. So it's so it would allow uh, Arizona Public Service Company, a regulated utility, to have a matter brought by this office on its behalf against WAPA. In in general, Arizona Public Service represents itself and doesn't need this office. But does it? Well, I guess I'm trying to figure out who does need this office. I, I appreciate that point. Can you give me an example of a of a, a consumer, a small business, or a residence that would be able to take advantage of this language? S certainly, that would be up to this office to determine what they perceive to be the consumer interest in any particular proceeding, and to the extent they identified that interest to represent it. Well, it says, on behalf of energy customers, on matters concerning rates or service of public utilities and national ga gas companies under the jurisdiction of the Commission. Well, I guess my question to you is, are any small businesses or residences uh, customers uh, of public utilities and natural gas companies under the jurisdiction of the Commission? Or are only utilities and gas pipelines customers of uh, those utilities under the jurisdiction of the Commission? Will the gentleman yield? I'd point? like to get counsel's answer and then I'd be happy to yield. Okay. The, 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 the consumer's interests are represented at the Commission in a number of ways and a number of parties participate in the Commission's proceedings as direct customers, as consumer interest groups and this office would be intended, as I understand the amendment, to identify what is perceived to be the consumer's interest in the same way that state consumer advocates offices attempt to do so and represent those interests in the proceedings of their commissions. I appreciate what you understand their intent is. I would be happy to yield to the chairman. I would still like to hear the name of a small business or of a residential customer who could be represented. The uh, FERC handles the wholesale, uh, wholesale 
uh, power. And in California, businesses and consumers were gouged by Enron Corporation, and FERC took no action. Had this office been in place, uh, the small businesses and, and the consumers in California could have gone to this office to seek some redress because FERC was not responding. And, and they are, those individuals are customers of, of a utility under the jurisdiction of the Commission? As this language? Yes. Thank you. My understanding. Much. And yield back. Are we ready now for the vote on the um, I, I have Inslee one and Schakowsky Amendment? Mr. Chair. I have a question on the Schakowsky Amendment. Does the customer consumer advocate uh, have uh, what, what would their real powers do in representing them? Would they be able to uh, help uh, the consumer with lawsuits? Why do you say that's not true? Uh, would they be able to help overturn a FERC decision? I, I'm going to ask counsel. Could or, the gentleman yield for just a minute? I, can, sure. I think I can answer and, and give you some examples, for example, uh, that, that might answer your question. Um, the FERC has collected over $6.3 billion from California electric market participants by facilitating, facilitating settlements. FERC is also working with Canadian energy officials to facilitate processing of a proposed Alaska natural gas pipeline. Um, which would bring natural gas from Alaska's North Slope to the lower 48. As I mentioned earlier, was involved in the California electricity crisis investigating allegations. So this would be an example of an uh, uh, um, investigation of electricity market manipulation by Enron and other energy consumers. So um, they were able to take their case to the FERC that de then did the uh, investigation, just examples. But, but they wouldn't, uh, the advocate wouldn't have the power to uh, develop a lawsuit on behalf of the consumer against Enron? All of these activities, as I understand it, take place in front of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. How about decisions by FERC? For example, uh, if we uh, pass an amendment here giving FERC siting power on transmission lines, uh, can a consumer that ostensibly would be impacted hire or, or go to the consumer advocate to get FERC to overturn that or find out a way to sue FERC to overturn that? Go ahead, what, Janice or counsel? Consumer advocacy offices, as they operate in the states where they operate, attempt to identify the general consumer interest. How would it operate here under the wording of this amendment? Well, this, they would essentially be in the place of another party before the Commission in its proceedings representing the general consumer interest rather than the specific interest of any particular party uh, that is represented in those proceedings. So, for example, with LNG siting where uh, for would have uh, permitting priority. The community was heard once. FERC decided differently. Can the community or its constituents then hire the advocate to then advocate for them against FERC, even though they already had a shot for that at a proceeding, uh, prior proceeding? Well, they would be subject to the same procedural rules as any other party. They would not get two bites at any particular decision. And they would not represent individual, individual um, consumers. They would not be hired by consumers. They would be public servants working in the Commission to identify the general consumer interest and assure that it was represented to the Commission for the Commission's decision making. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. I under, would yield. To under the current law, in electricity, FERC has jurisdiction over wholesale transactions in interstate commerce. Wholesale transactions in interstate commerce for electricity. You're going to set up a consumer advocate's office that would be a consumer advocate for large power companies and states that engage in wholesale electricity transactions across state lines. Retail rates and retail transactions are regulated, if at all, 
at the state level by the state PUC commission. Will the gentleman yield? Claim back my time, yield to the gentleman from Kentucky. Also on page two, uh, when, when it talks about the responsibilities of this advocate representing uh, the consumer at hearings of the commission in judicial proceedings, but the way I read this, they also would have the authority to represent consumers at hearings or proceedings of other federal regulatory agencies and commissions, which I would interpret to mean any federal agency in the federal government. How would you interpret that? On page two, on line nine. Uh, that's what the language says. So uh, this would not be applicable only to FERC. This would be applicable to any federal agency or commission. Well, I would interpret that as meaning that to the extent a FERC proceeding or a FERC issue were picked up at another federal agency, such as, for example, if a, a gas market issue became an issue at the consumer um, at well you know once again we get down to judicial interpretation because the language clearly states at hearings or proceedings of other federal regulatory agencies and commissions the time has expired is there further debate chairman? who seeks recognition chairman yes mr. Boyer I move to strike the last word and I, I would ask my friend from Washington uh, a question um, because I'm trying to, as I read your amendment, I mean, I, I, I read this and this is something that I think is, is good. Uh, if we want to really uh, engage and support the private sector for institutional physical infrastructure necessary to promote development of sustainable biomass fuels, bioenergy technologies, I don't, I don't have problems with, with that at all, Jay. I just don't understand how you could have voted against the Walden Amendment and then offer this amendment. So help me, under, help me understand. I'm out in the Midwest. We got corn. I don't have forest. So help, help me understand how you could, when, when Mr. Walden sought to uh, help, help me reconcile that. How do you vote against Walden and then offer this amendment? Well, there are certain questions you probably wish you hadn't asked, and I think if you give me your last four minutes, you'll probably decide you wouldn't want to ask that question. But the answer is, is that my friends across the aisle seem so enamored with benchmarks now. But I don't remember them saying that you were going to put benchmarks wait, wait a second. when the Bush... Well, now, you asked me a question. If you'd like me to answer it, I will answer it. Would you like me to answer the yeah, question? I don't think it has anything to do with benchmarks. Well, um, you asked me a question, friend, and if you'd like me to answer it, I will. And if you want to go home and take a vote on this, I'll do that. Which would you prefer? Either one's well, fine. Well, then I'll, re I'll reclaim my time. Fine with me. I ask you a very simple question, and you want to talk about benchmarks. I, I look at your amendment and go, Jay, your amendment makes sense. What I can't reconcile is, how do you vote against Walden yet offer this amendment? So I, and I'll ask that specific If you'll ask, ask me and give me your remaining three minutes, I'll answer your question. And the reason is, is your benchmarks are so uh, outside of the realm the way you make legislation. Let me give you an example. When we had the Enron crisis, and we went on a bipartisan basis to the Bush administration asking them to solve this problem for the little guy, whose rates went up 1,000% in the West Coast. And we went to Vice President Dick Cheney, and we pleaded with him to do something about it. Mr. Vice President, please set a benchmark that if the rates remain so outrageous that you'll do something about it. We didn't get any benchmarks from the Republican administration to do anything about the Enron situation. When we had the Bush tax cuts... All right, I reclaim my time. Let me I reclaim my time. I don't know what the hell Bush tax cuts and Enron have to do with this specific... What it has to do with is when you adopt legislation, you don't try to predict the entire future. If you want benchmarks, I suppose we could put benchmarks in that if this does what we think it's going to do, which is to create twice as many jobs as we even think it will. I'm much more optimistic than maybe my colleagues. Would the, would Should we put a benchmark in that if it creates more jobs that will adopt a tougher cap? No, because it's just too difficult to get the crystal ball out. Our, All I know is we're going to have Congresses in the future. If this thing goes sideways, future oh, Congresses oh. can deal with it. If it's better, they can make it even tougher. Right, the, let me reclaim my time. Is, no, wait a second. This is my time. 
I don't, still don't get it. I asked a very simple question, how you reconcile voting against Walden and offer this amendment. I think this is a good amendment. I just can't, please close the door. I just can't, please close the door. I can't figure out how you vote against Walden and then offer this amendment. I look at this and say, okay, my wife and I not long ago went from Denver and drove up uh, towards Breckenridge onto, what's the, Vale. And I see, when I, as I come over the first ridge, I see forest as far as the eye can see, and it's dead. It's dead. At some point, if that catches fire, Breckenridge is going to be gone. And I look at that and say, why can't we go in and go out and go get that wood? And I, when I look at, the, as, as whoever drafted this, and I listened to Mr. Stupak talking about this negotiation, and, you know, Mr. Walden here came and he, he tried to provide a definition with regard to what is a mature forest stand. And, Mr. Ensley, you voted against that. And then I look at this and say, if you are so concerned with regard to protecting and maintaining institutional and physical infrastructure to promote the deployment of sustainable biomass, how could you have voted against what, what Mr. Walden was doing. Let me ask. That has it, nothing to do with Enron. It has nothing to do with Bush tax cuts. Would you like me to answer your question? Please. Um, when I go to the Wenatchee National Forest, as I did last summer, places I've been going since, since I was six years old, there are thousands of acres of dead and dying trees because of a budworm. And it's caused by climate change because now the winters aren't cold enough. They are not cold enough to kill the beetles that are killing our trees. Now, one of the reasons I'm voting against some of your amendments is I believe that they will not be of assistance to stop the thing that's killing the forest that both you and I love. That's a reason. may not be good enough, but I hope we can pass this little amendment that apparently we both agree on. Thank you. Well, that was more helpful, Jay. Thank you. The gentleman's time has well, expired. I'd like to now proceed to a vote. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I have a quick question for counsel, if I might, please. Let me just ask how many members wish to speak on this amendment. One, two, three. If, uh, I would like to uh, request that uh, we limit the time to three minutes each. Without objection, that will be the order. No, I am reserving the right to object. I, I, in fact, I object. I don't know what. Uh, okay. Mr. I'm Hughes coming into recognized. this. You willing to accept three minutes? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Council, I'd like to go back to the Schakowsky Amendment, uh, back to the Section 3 under duties, starting at line 17 on page 1, going through um, the bottom of page 2, line 11. My first question is, it talks about complaints being brought on behalf of energy customers on matters concerning rates and services of public utilities and natural gas companies. Are those currently subjects of litigation in federal court under current law? Under current law in both the Natural Gas Act and the Federal Power Act, there are special provisions for complaints to be brought by consumers alleging that a natural gas act, a natural gas company or a public utilities rates are unjust and unreasonable and the commission will then entertain such complaints. This provision would give this consumer advocacy office the same power as other representatives before FERC on that matter. Specifically looking at subparagraph I, it gives them the right for judicial proceedings in the courts of the United States. Do they currently have the right to bring those complaints in judicial proceedings of the United States? Um, this gives me an opportunity to correct my prior answer in terms of sub, um, which, which is Clause 3, but it applies to Clause I-2. The only instance in which this Consumer Advocacy Office would appear in a judicial proceeding in the Court of the United States is under the um, subparagraph A language that restricts that to being on matters concerning rates or service of public utilities and natural gas companies under the jurisdiction of the Commission. So to the extent that this consumer office participated at the Commission in a regulatory proceeding regarding a natural gas company or a public utility, and that decision was appealed to court, as frequently happens, the consumer office would be able to participate in the appeal as well. But it is restricted in the courts and in 
the other federal agencies and commissions to those matters that are um, related to the rates and service of the utilities under the FERC jurisdiction. So it is, it is limited. It would not bring a complaint directly in a federal court, but if there were a complaint proceeding at FERC that were appealed, it could continue to participate. It would not have to drop off. So we're not creating a new federal cause of action? No. Only a question of who can act on behalf of whom? This would allow this office to act on behalf of consumers through the entire process at FERC and beyond an appeal. And you're saying the judicial proceedings would only be an appeal, in effect, uh, of the initial rulemaking powers or the initial proceedings before the commission? The, this language clearly limits this office to appearing in federal court only when it concerns rates or service of public utilities and natural gas companies under the jurisdiction of the Commission. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Blackburn, are you willing to take three minutes or do you want your whole five? Mr. Chairman, I, my question was specifically about the judicial. No, I, I, I want to recognize you. How much time do you want me to recognize I, you? I for? can go with even less than three minutes. Thank okay, you. Okay, I'll recognize you for three minutes, and if you give back some, that's okay too. Thank you. I appreciate that. My question dealt with the judicial proceedings and uh, the the clarification that Mr. Deal was just seeking, and I appreciate. Having that, I, I think the only other question I would have for counsel is going down to line 17 of page 2, uh, C, where it says investigate independently without duplicating any commission investigation or within the context of formal proceedings, the services provided by the rates charged by and the valuation. So my concern would be and my question would be under this and with the, could they instigate an investigation and then on behalf of a rate payer and then carry that investigation into a court and represent them from your reading from, from this. My reading of the language is they could indicate in, in, initiate a separate investigation um, of the services provided by the rates charged by the companies that FERC regulates. Okay. Um, and then the, carry that into a court. They could investigate. Okay. All right. Thank you. You'll back. Mr. Walden, to close the debate. I recognize uh, you for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to speak in opposition uh, to the Inslee Amendment, and, and I do so because of, in part, the uh, issues raised by my colleague, uh, Mr. Booyer. And, and I want to raise here perhaps somebody, Nathan, if you want to. Uh, Hold this up. This is, this is an example of what we're talking about. This is an overstock stand. It's in Northern California. And um, it's a stand that uh, needs to be reduced uh, in terms of the mass there uh, to deal with fire risk. That's one strategy for adapting to a drier, warmer climate. Now, this photo was taken before the, pro the uh, thinning took place. Now, let's go to the next one, please. This is what they're trying to get to and manage to. This is an old growth stand, all right? This is to adapt to climate change. This is, uh, according to the Pacific Northwest Research Station, their science update on how you adapt forest management. Now, part of the argument I'm making, we can put that one down, this is what they're trying to manage. You open up the stand, it allows the old growth trees to become healthier, survive bug infestation because they're not stressed, Indeed, if you've got climate change, you have warmer, drier temperature, warmer temperatures, drier climate, more drought, more risk. My argument in my amendment, and I'll continue to offer various versions of it in the days and nights ahead, is that that material that they took out to get this stand in balance should count as renewable energy if it's put in some sort of device that either turns it into a brick like this or a puck or is, is burned as pellets to heat a school like they're doing, uh, well, actually a hospital in Burns and a, and a school in Enterprise. Now let's go to the, the last one here. This is what you get when a fire goes through a forest. This is called a forest fire. And the debris that is left, this is out in, Mal out in Harney County, where, by the way, they have more than 20% unemployment right now. There is a company, perhaps represented in this room, that is interested in citing 
a biomass facility to take debris like this off the Malheur National Forest and burn it efficiently, cleanly. EPA's looked at all this. You can go find all the data on how they do this and produce electricity. What holds them back? They can't get a guarantee of supply off the Malheur National Forest. Even though at the current rate of treatment, the Malheur National Forest will take 28 years to catch up with the overstock stands, kind of like the ones I showed you in the first picture. Now, I guess, I, I, with, with all due respect to my, my friend from Washington State, those folks don't need universities and others to go spend five million or whatever it is. They're ready to put people to work in a county that's got over 20 percent seasonally unadjusted unemployment. This county, by the way, is, if you lose your job in, 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 in Burns, it's like driving from here to Philadelphia, from here to, 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 to John Day to get a job. That's the nearest community. These are really rural areas, okay? Surrounded by national forests that we're the stewards of, and we're doing a crummy job of that stewardship. And then you put in law provisions that prevent these folks from taking the material that has to come out to get in balance to deal with climate change and put it in a modern, efficient, new technology, new energy device to produce electricity, to heat a hospital, and reduce their carbon emissions substantially because they're not using petroleum products now. All the things you say you want, you vote against. And we get high unemployment. And you get forest fires. And we don't get ahead of the problem. The Wenatchee Forest full of bug infestation. By the way, the material that would come off of that as they thin and take it out, because that's a mature stand forest, won't qualify as renewable energy, won't qualify as a biofuel if they turn it into that. So you don't create the incentives, you don't create the jobs. That's why I'm passionate about this. Come walk in our shoes. Gentleman Yield, for a question? Yes, certainly, sir. So you will vote against Mr. Inslee's proposal to set up a, a national bioenergy partnership with five regions to uh, try to bring the private sector and the government together. For right. The, because you voted against your amendment. No, that's not it, and reclaiming my time. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because the answer he proposes is to go borrow $5 million from somebody. We sure as God knows doesn't have it. You're going to have to go borrow it. It's going to be more to the debt. To create a whole new government and, and, and infrastructure system where, frankly, we've got the material. You've got the private sector ready to invest. They'll do the right thing for the forest, the ecology, the environment, the habitat, the jobs, reduce forest fires, do all the right things, create markets and put people to work. And my time's expired. We'll now proceed to a vote on the, uh, the two amendments in block offered by Mr. Inslee and Ms. Schakowsky. And we'll go right to a roll call vote. All those in favor of the amendment will vote aye when their name is called, or those opposed will vote no. Accepted those two. And then For both of them? Are these in block? Mr. Waxman. Uh, aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Two. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, aye. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Inslee. I'm sorry. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Engel. <laughs> Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Brick, Mr. Green passes. Ms. Deget. Ms. Deget votes aye. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, Ms. Harmon, aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky, aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson. 
Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melison. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Aye. Ms. Castor votes aye. Ms. Sar Mr. Sarbanes. Aye. Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Aye. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton votes aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, no. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, no. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield votes no. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, no. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Mr. Bono, Ms. Bonomack. Ms. Bonomack votes no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, no. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green, aye. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, aye. Everyone here. There's a Ms. Bono Mac wishes to I'm sorry. respond to the rule. Ms. Bono Mac, off, no, and on, aye. Have all members responded to the rule? Any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the uh, clerk will tally the vote. Bless you. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the yeas were 36 and the nays were 20. 36 ayes, 20 noes. The um, amendments are agreed to. Let me uh, tell the members, I think, that you deserve a great deal of credit for the uh, deliberation today. I think we've made a lot of progress. We still have quite a ways to go. And I want to uh, announce that we will now proceed to take one uh, amendment on the Republican side and one amendment on the Democratic side to Title I, and then we will uh, end for the evening. Tomorrow we will come back, at, and we have been here, I guess, 12 and a half hours, or at least 12 and a half hours since we started this morning. 
Tomorrow we'll come back at 10. When we come back at 10, uh, I will recognize a Democrat amendment and a Republican amendment on Title I. I would urge members to try to uh, consolidate as many amendments as possible so that we can move as quickly as possible. And then I will recognize members in Title II, and we'll have amendments to Title II for three or four hours, and uh, then we'll move on from there. So I just wanted to alert the members to uh, uh, what my expectations would be for tomorrow. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just Mr. want Martin. to ask a few questions, what you just said. Certainly it's appropriate to try to consider amendments on other titles, but I want to make sure that members that have amendments to Title I won't be precluded at some point in the markup from coming back to that title, because we still have about 40 amendments to Title I. The members won't be precluded from offering amendments to Title I. Uh, as, I as I indicated earlier, when we go by a title that doesn't close out amendments, it uh, puts them off for later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Let's see. We now will recognize an amendment on the Republican side of Ms. Blackburn. I believe you have an amendment at the desk. You're seeking recognition to offer an amendment. Uh, and is that amendment to Title I? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it is. And will the clerk inform us whether the amendment meets the time qualification? Yes, it is, Mr. Chairman. The uh, clerk will report the uh, amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. Blackburn. In section one, without objection, the, the amendment will be considered as read, and the chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Minutes. And this amendment has uh, been distributed and is on the members' desk. It deals with disclosure of cost in consumer bills, and Mr. Upton joins me in this amendment. And we've had a lot of discussion today about needing to get information for, to consumers so that they will know uh, what is in this legislation. And the need, we just talked about the need for having a consumer advocate and protecting consumers. Well, this is a way that we can take a proactive step in making certain that consumers have the information that they need because they need to know, we all agree, consumers ought to know when they're purchasing something, what it costs them and what the price is for items on the, that they are going to purchase. And the legislation that we have been talking about today with cap and trade, great discussion about whether we're going to see it yield a savings or whether it's going to yield a cost. And we know that our consumers potentially can see a significant increase in what they are paying for services. So these cost increases that are passed along to consumers and businesses in their utility bills, in their manufactured products at the gas pumps, that will be reflected on their bill so that they will know what this legislation is costing them. And the amendment would require the EPA administrator to put forth regulations that would require the disclosure of all those items on the bills. Now, the, the amendment is, would require the administrator within six months of the date of enactment of this legislation to bring forth regulations that would require utilities, motor vehicle providers, manufacturers, food providers be required to show the cost of compliance with the Waxman-Markey bill in each utility bill at the fuel pump on all of the man manufactured products. Put it on the label, put it on the food label so that consumers will know what the true cost is of this legislation. I think that this is the way to take a proactive step and get that information that consumers are going to want to know about the cost of enactment of the legislation. And at this time, I will yield to Mr. Upton. Oh, he left. <laughs> Well, sorry, I just want to join in support of this. I would note that um, we do a lot of this in Michigan already. As I said a few hours ago in Michigan, when we passed uh, the Renewable Portfolio Standard uh, mandate, our customers are going to know exactly what those costs are. And I think that that's important for consumers across the country to know what this bill will cost them. 
And I'd like to think that we might be able to save a little time and pass this by voice. It's a good amendment, and I join a good lady from Tennessee in support of it. Yield, I yield back to the gentlelady. I yield back. To Will the gentlelady yield? Be happy to yield. I rise in strong support of this amendment. I think it's one of the most important amendments we've heard all day. Uh, during the evening, we've heard a number of complaints uh, that all of the prior amendments have suspended the effectiveness of the law, repealed the law if unemployment went up or electricity prices went up or gasoline prices went up. And there's been consistent objection, indeed eloquent objection, that that's not an appropriate way to legislate uh, and that we ought to offer some other remedy. It seems to me in an era when transparency is so important and when consumers deserve to know what they are paying for, that this is kind of the rock bottom minimum. We have pledged to the American people that we are going to be open and straightforward with, that, for, forward with them about costs. There are many analyses of those costs uh, from various competing sources. As I've mentioned earlier in my comments tonight, the uh, Heritage Foundation has put out information talking about how much prices will go up. I think the least we can do uh, to disclose to the consuming public the various costs added by this legislation. Americans need to be able to engage in an informed discussion and to know uh, how much the prices are going up on the various goods they're buying so that they can make a cost-benefit analysis of the evils they're avoiding in terms of increased greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, em dioxide emissions, uh, and to realize what they are paying to avoid those in order to protect the environment, uh, at least as alleged by the advocates of this legislation. It seems to, we, to me that if we don't disclose those costs to them, they cannot make an informed decision. Uh, I join uh, uh, both the gentlelady from Tennessee and the gentleman from Michigan and support and commend this amendment uh, and thank the lady for yielding. Gentlelady's time has expired. Who seeks recognition on the amendment? Mr. Markey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, I speak in opposition to this uh, amendment. Let me begin by saying that the EPA has already estimated the cost uh, that will occur from this bill. Uh, the, the costs are quite small. Uh, the EPA estimates that the cost to a typical household will amount to 27 to 38 cents per day for the entire household. And that is without taking into account energy efficiency provisions uh, in the other parts of the bill. EPA has estimated that the cost of gasoline will be about two cents per gallon increase uh, for each year. Last year, gas prices went up $2. Uh, and where did that $2 go? Well, it went into the pockets of hostile regimes uh, all around uh, the world who used that money to fund uh, uh, armed efforts against us and against our allies. Uh, the truth is that this will be a huge imposition on businesses across the country. This will put an incredible administrative burden uh, on, uh, on companies, uh, on utilities, um, that will not, in fact, uh, outweigh whatever benefits um, the minority hopes that the consumer will, uh, in fact, derive. So you already have an estimate from the EPA, if that's what you're interested in. Um, but if you're interested in imposing an incredible administrative burden on every single company, every single product, uh, in terms of its need then to be uh, uh, subdivided into the actual cost, uh, then you'll wind up raising the cost of all of these goods uh, that you intend, uh, uh, obviously, on informing consumers about. Uh, and perhaps the cost of that should be advertised to the consumers as well, because I fear that it would be greater uh, than any of the costs that would be imposed uh, by the effects of this bill. And by the way, uh, when more efficient automobiles are made, when homes are better insulated, when appliances consume 50 percent of, uh, of the energy which they consume today, all of those benefits as well will be derived by the consumers in our country. So I urge uh, a no vote on this amendment. Uh, I think it really is just meant uh, once again, to, uh, to uh, go right to the heart of the opposition of the minority to the legislation. Uh, but uh, the estimates have already been made, and if you want them, the EPA has them available. Uh, the I will, will the gentleman yield? yield? I will be glad to yield. Um, I, if you believe that the cost will not go up, or will not go up meaningfully, or indeed will go down, then why would you oppose disclosure of that information to consumers? Um, when, when a small business in any of our districts are manufacturing widgets, 
how in the world are they going to be able to determine uh, what the cost of the legislation that we are now considering had on the production of that widget? The cost to that company in discharging the responsibility placed upon that uh, company's CEO uh, will obviously uh, be an additional business expense uh, that will exceed whatever information is derived from that effort. And so uh, it's, it's ultimately a counterproductive uh, proposal which the gentleman is making because what you're really looking for is the macro um, uh, re result, I hope, and that's what EPA has already done. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have millions and millions of businesses being forced uh, to make this calculation, and the cost will be astronomical. I if, yield back to the If balance. the gentleman would yield. Sure. Would the gentleman yield? I'll be glad to yield, yes. I, I thank the gentleman so much. Uh, the EPA estimates that you are referencing are not what we are addressing in this. What we say is that the administrator would put in place within six months of the date of enactment of this legislation rules that would require the utilities, the uh, motor vehicle providers, manufacturers, to make known what the cost of this legislation is. Now, there is already retail transactional software that can compute this. So it is not as if you're giving them some type mandate which would be difficult to meet. If I'm there is software that can go in and compute this for them. So I, I think I may, that what it would I, be. I may, if the general lady would let me I, I will, my time. Yes. Your, your amendment actually says manufactured product labels. That would be the manufacturer of every product in the United States. Food label. That would be every farmer or every, Re reclaiming every my time. producer well, of goods it's not in our your country. Time. <laughs> and so you would spread this across, the way it's written, millions of small business people in our country who would then have to put together a compliance uh, a program uh, that uh, would ultimately cost, God knows what the number would, but it would, it would be in the tens of millions of dollars for the American business. Mr. Markey's time has expired. We'll now go to uh, the Republican side, Mr. Stearns. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Markey, uh, EPA made estimates. These are estimates, not actual. It's interesting to note that the majority put forth this bill without getting a CBO estimates. Now, he quotes the EPA. Now, there's a couple modeling flaws that were used by EPA in getting these estimates. The most egregious one is they assumed 150 percent growth in nuclear. 150 gigawatts in additional nuclear power. Now, I don't see anywhere in the bill where they could make that assumption. They also assume, these, another assumption, that India and China um, will basically reduce their emissions by 2015. And they're onwards. Now, I don't think that's a credible estimate. They also believe that customers will get rebates from these allowances. They also talk about the recession. They actually assume that the current recession will put a permanent damper on economic growth. So I guess my point is that EPA's estimates are flawed, and there's, in fact, seven of them that are flawed. And so when you look at them and you say, as Mr. Upton indicated, Michigan is already implementing this, so it's not a huge administrative effort. And frankly, frankly, I think everybody in my state, when they get their utility bill, they like to see what the costs are, just when they get their telephone bill. How do those different incremental costs go in a composite way to the total? Well, the so how you... hard would it be to have the utility company tell you why the utility is going up if it's due to renewables. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, I think that if the gentleman suspects the methodology used by the EPA in determining what the macro cost will be, what confidence could the gentleman have in the EPA under this amendment? Well, put together well, the a methodology is, for every manufacturer, every company in the United States oh, the to make a determination. Is they, 
they would not be estimating. Do. They would actually With, within six months after this law passes. Well, they would have actual uh, data to use. Now, the mandatory reporting <laughs> rules that you support already require manufacturers and others to collect this information for their company. Isn't that true, Mr. Markey? Excuse me, can you repeat that question, please? The mandatory reporting rules that you support already require manufacturers and others to collect this information for their company. Uh, that's that, our understanding. Is that so? So if in effect that's true, together with the need for our customers to have a realistic appraisal of what's happening, I think this is a very reasonable amendment. And I think everybody on the other side would say, look, we're in favor of food labeling. That has not been a big problem. We'd like to see our utility costs broken out. We'd like to see our phone costs broken out. Why not see what the cost of the renewable would be? Thank you. Surely you couldn't be against that, even those, even those consumer advocates. On would, the, would the gentleman yield? I'd, I'd be glad to yield. Thank you. The, the, the rules that are included in this legislation only cover um, the class of emitters, and those are the largest emitters of greenhouse gases. What this amendment calls for is every manufacturer of every manufactured of product, regardless of size, every food labeling company, regardless of size, all across the country. So you're creating a broad-based program, which was something that we deliberately avoided in terms of targeting the largest emitters for coverage under this legislation. Well, I think the gentleman is sort of making a compromise here. He's saying he could support it perhaps if we just covered certain entities or major emitters. Or major emitters. Um, another thought is, um, you know, when we talk about automobiles, they tell the content of automobiles. I mean, I think across our spectrum in our economy, we see well manufacturers are telling the consumer this information. And it appears in a, in a small way that you've already instituted in the bill this mandatory collection. So, I mean, perhaps if you object to it being, as the bill points out, on utility bills, fuel pumps, manufactured products, label, food label, maybe there's just one or two items that you would agree to, and that would make it uh, acceptable to you. Is that possible? Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. This amendment doesn't pass a laugh test. Let's let just see what this amendment says. In six months after this law is enacted, we're going to have the administrator of EPA promulgate regulations to require that the cost, will be, the cost of compliance with this act, borne directly or indirectly by utilities and all the others, will have to be disclosed. Well, some of those costs are not going to be incurred for many years, if not decades. We didn't put everything in place at once. We wanted, for example, to have a um, a period of time in which, uh, in which we have utilities operating, burning coal, and uh, then at some point, many decades down the road, there'll be carbon sequestration. Uh, I don't know how they could possibly, in, in six months, try to figure out the cost of compliance. Now, just cost of compliance directly or indirectly by utilities, motor, uh, motor vehicle fuel providers, manufacturers of products, providers of food. Now, uh, and then you have this, all this is going to be disclosed. I can't imagine what kind of bureaucracy would have to be created to try to do this job. In fact, I can't imagine any bureaucracy that can do this job. You can hire lots of people to do a lot of analyses, but you're not going to get an answer that's going to be in any way uh, give any information. Then there's going to be a requirement that the price paid by consumers resulting directly from this act shall be disclosed on each utility bill, fuel pump, manufactured product label, or food label. Now let's see a food label. You go and you buy a, a processed food. It comes in a package. It's frozen. Now uh, the cost of freezing it, the cost of transporting it, the cost of the ingredients, uh, and how long they were, uh, that what the transportation the costs were for those ingredients to be uh, taken from one place to another. You can go on and on and on trying to figure out uh, how this administrator at EPA is going to have to figure out the, to have to deal with this mandate. Now, 
Um, what is the cost of uh, our growing reliance on foreign oil? That's a huge cost. Consumers might want to have that information disclosed to them. What is the cost of the failure of the Securities and Exchange Commission from regulating the markets under the Bush administration when that agency pretty much went to sleep to let big corporate traders do whatever they wanted to do? Well, we know some of the costs, the collapse of our economy. But somebody should try to give us some assessment of those costs and disclose it to the consumer. What is the cost of the, uh, of the um, uh, outing of a CIA agent by the Bush administration? Oh, well, it meant a lot because people within the CIA had to worry what the consequences were going to be to them. What were the costs of torturing prisoners? Maybe the American people would like to know that. Uh, what is it going to mean for our gentleman troops? yield? No, I'm not going to yield. What's the, what was the cost of, cost of FEMA? We have a couple of members here from, uh, uh, from Louisiana. What was the cost to your constituents of FEMA not being able to do its job? Because the head of a FEMA, the head of FEMA was some crony. And then after, even after he left, FEMA was so uh, deprived of funds and leadership and ability to do its job. So you could ask for costs that are very relevant from a lot of different uh, points of view, and we could set up huge bureaucracies to try to figure out those costs. But to what purpose? This amendment would ask a new bureaucracy to figure out, six months after the enactment of this law, all these different costs to each of these different, uh, different uh, utilities and motor vehicles and others, I just think that uh, there's no purpose in this. This amendment, like the other, so many of the other amendments we've heard today, is just to try to drive home a, a theme. People should be scared. People should be scared of this law because uh, uh, this may result in the collapse of our economy, a huge unemployment, all these other things that nobody's been able to establish. Uh, if it's such a scary act, why is it being supported by the utilities, the EEI? Why is it being supported by the auto manufacturers? Why is it being supported uh, by uh, so many of the other business communities, especially those who were part of the U.S. cap? Uh, I, I just think that uh, what we're seeing is a lot of obfuscation by the uh, Republicans about uh, the legislation and trying to drive uh, scare tactics home. So Time General has expired. Mr. Chairman. Well, well I'm, I'm going to recognize you on your own time because I've exceeded right. my time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barton. I ask, uh, I rise in support of the um, Blackburn Amendment and seek recognition. You speak get, in favor. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Cranky, cranky, cranky. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a, a good debate today. Uh, points have been made on both sides. Uh, there is a theme to some of the Republican amendments, we'll admit it, and that theme is not to scare the American public. That theme is to drive home that there are going to be costs to this. There are. In the, in the testimony before... And benefits. Well, that's a debatable proposition, but at the appropriate time tomorrow, we can have that debate. Um, you know, I will grant that on your side you think you, you perceive there to be benefits. And if you'll grant on our side that we perceive that there are going to be real cost. We didn't have any testimony that didn't say that this act, if implemented, although that we didn't have the actual cap-and-trade allowance system that is now in your bill, uh, wasn't going to, uh, uh, to have cost. Now, we've tried to put some uh, price cap protection on various aspects of those, what we think will be real cost increases. We don't know what those costs are going to be. The Blackburn Amendment just simply says whatever it is, the American people have a right to know it. Uh, this amendment doesn't say suspend the act. It's just a transparency amendment. That's all it is. Um, six months, you've got a valid point. Six months is not a reasonable amount of time. But you could take your remarks against Blackburn Amendment, 
strip out the word Blackburn and put in the Waxman Amendment in the nature of a substitute, and we'd be making almost the same speech. So, you know, it's, it is scary to think about some of these cost increases that are going to come down the road. Uh, it, it's very scary. Um, again, we've asked the CBO to score it. Uh, hopefully they'll score the first five years and we'll have it available before this markup concludes uh, sometime this week. But I will, I will point out that the EPA analysis, if you talk about doesn't pass the laugh test, the EPA analysis doesn't even attempt to cost Title II and Title IV of your amendment. It assumes a, a huge number of nuclear power plants being built in this country. It assumes compliance with Coyoto by the signatory countries at a time certain. It, it assumes a, an offset uh, compliance internationally that is almost guaranteed not to happen. And so if you make all those assumptions, you can talk about $10 a ton emission. But if, if you include some of the things and you use reasonable assumptions uh, that the EPA didn't do, which the EPA even admits that some of their assumptions are questionable, you're not going to get $10 a ton. You're probably not going to get $20 or $30 or $40 a ton. You're going to get somewhere between $50 and $100 a ton. And at $50 to $100 a ton, the cost of this on an annual basis, even in the early years, is over $100 billion a year. So excuse us if we say, let's have a transparency amendment that exposes what these costs are. The American people have a right to know. Uh, one thing that we know on the Republican side is this is not a free lunch. You know, um, it is going to be costly. It may not be as costly as some of us fear it to be, but it is definitely going to be costly, and there should be some transparency. That's why this is an important amendment. And uh, if, if you want to change the compliance date so that we have a little more time to get the data, if you don't trust your own EPA and you want to let the EIA do the data collection and, 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 and review, those are amendments that, that we would certainly accept. At least I think the, the author of the amendment would accept. But the basic premise of transparency uh, and accountability to the people who vote for us and elect us to repre re represent them, that's not a laugh test, and we make no apologies for it. So I support the uh, amendment. You would the gentleman yield? I've got only nine seconds, but I'll be happy. That's all it'll take me. You know, the chairman said it was laughable, and I read down here where it says an increase in the price paid. That means it's been paid. He says if it's not enclosed, or if it hadn't been incurred, uh, you couldn't report Well, hell no, you couldn't report it. it. It hadn't occurred. So you at least belong in the giggle gallery, Mr. Chairman, if he's laughable. I think that you read these here, it shows that he paid it by consumers resulting directly from this act shall be disclosed. That means when it says price paid, that means it's been paid. Uh, it's, and it means it's been incurred in all likelihood. So I don't really see anything laughable about this. I think this is a bill that would give some idea of what's happening and, and report to the people and let a little light into the situation. And I'll take it back. I don't really think you belong in the giggle gallery. Thank you. Are we ready for the vote on the amendment? Gentleman from Louisiana. Chairman, uh, thank you. Requesting time in support of the Blackburn Amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I liked uh, her description of it so, so well. I want to yield time to Ms. Blackburn. I'd like to hear her talk about it again. So I yield my time to Ms. Blackburn. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Mr. Chairman, I think that you were beginning to hit on where so many people that we are talking to have concerns. And you said uh, that, that it is hard to equate this, this tax, but that's where they're going. People know this is going to be an energy tax. They know they're going to be paying more. You mentioned the frozen food that they would buy at the store. Absolutely, they know it's going to cost more to plant that crop, to harvest that crop, 
to go in and prepare that crop so that it becomes a food item, a processed food item that goes to the grocery store. You have that additional cost for trans transportation. You have additional cost to cool it when it is in the store. And then they're going to take it home and they will incur cost. So they know that every step of the way they're going to be spending more because of this cap and trade bill. They realize that. What we want them to know is to be able to figure it out, to be able to say, this is what the cost is. And I can assure you, there is, there is methodology and there is software that will handle what your savings is and what your cost is on uh, retail transactions. There is uh, equipment that can be used to help manufacturers are labeling. They are working through the process of how many calories are in a bite, how much every single ounce of something costs. All of that labeling is transparent. When you go to the grocery store, if you went to the grocery store with me on Saturday over to Publix, you could go in and see how much per ounce everything that you want to buy is going to be. We're saying add something do, to this. Let them know what the additional cost that comes from the Waxman Markey compliance is going to be. Let them see how much they are going to be paying for this. They have the right to know because they are the ones that are paying the bill. And we feel that that element of transparency is important for the consumers in order for them to appreciate the cost that they are incurring. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman from Georgia still has the time. Mr. Chairman, reclaiming my time and yielding back my time. Uh, yes, Mr. Gentlemen's. Those of us in Washington, we, when we introduce legislation, of course, we always feel like the benefits are going to be great. And, and the benefits may be great from this uh, legislation. But I think the gentlelady from uh, Tennessee has a good point, and that is we should focus more on the cost. Now, we don't know what the compliance cost of this legislation will be. But during the 13 hours we've been here today, I went through this bill every page and I found out that we are authorizing to be appropriated in this bill $2.8 trillion. In addition to that, we sell the allowances. It's going to be somewhere between $657 billion and $1.7 trillion. In addition to that, that does not include the $7,500 that will be available to anyone that has a mobile home manufactured before 1976. And it has, a, and they're in the poverty level of 200 percent or below. Does not include those costs. Does not include the cost of the civil penalties of up to one million dollars a day. Does not include the criminal penalties of up to a hundred million dollars on certain violations. So we don't know the compliance cost, but we d can know the actual cost of appropriate funds, selling the allowances, buying the mobile homes and all of that. And I say that simply because the benefits may outweigh that. But I think it is important we pass this legislation when we discuss this legislation that we do focus on these costs. And the numbers that I mentioned didn't in include uh, the $90 million that was authorized by the uh, building centers that we're going to establish around the country. And with that, I yield back to balance my time. Are we ready for the question? Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'll just be two minutes. Uh, first off, with respect to the specific amendment proposed, I agree with you and uh, Chairman Markey that it would create an, a crushing administrative burden across the country. I also think it's unfair to compare the measurement that uh, Ms. Blackburn wants to do to what the EPA is trying to do because although I'm not an economist, I think if we had economists here, they would say that you can build models that will tell you what the aggregate impact of legislation of this kind might be across the economy 
but you can't build models that will allow you to take it down to the level that's being proposed with any kind of um, certainty. So I think the exercise, even leaving aside the administrative burden it could create, the exercise is probably a futile one. And for that reason, I would, I would urge that we, we reject the amendment. But on this larger theme that we've been hearing, I just wanted to make a comment. And that is, um, there is a, there's a phrase I like, which is that, you know, it's very difficult to predict the future. We're, we're all struggling with that here. Um, but there's a phrase that the best way to predict the future is to create it. We're trying to create a new future here when it comes to energy. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy to achieve this transition. But the scariest thing of all is to stay where we are. And I think the American people understand that implicitly. We cannot stay where we are. We keep getting caught in the switches because we haven't moved forward. And it's going to be hard. And Mr. Scalise talked about 55 pages of this bill to talk about the impact on American workers. Well, that's because we care what happens in a transition. We're not going to leave anybody behind. The allowances that you've chosen to distribute in ways that will try to ease the impact because we don't want to leave people behind in, a, in what's going to be a difficult transition. But that doesn't mean we don't need to get to that new place. That's what this is all about. So yes, it's tough, but Americans are very resourceful and resilient people. They're up to the challenge. That's what we hear every day when we go around in our districts. And that's why we have to proceed forward on this bill. I yield back. Are we ready for the uh, vote on the amendment? Let's. Uh Proceed to a roll call vote. I suspect, suspect we'll get there. <laughs> Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. <coughs> Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green, no. Ms. Deget. Ms. Deget, no. Mrs. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. No. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Chikowski. Ms. Chikowski, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sul Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. 
Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer votes aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bono Mack. No. Ms. Bono Mack votes no. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. No. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes aye. Mr. Scully. Mr. Scully, aye. We missed it. Ms. Castor. Votes. Ms. Castor. Voting. Votes no. Ms. Castor votes no. Anybody else? Mr. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Ross, I never see you. Mr. Ross votes no. Have all members responded to the roll? Any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will tally the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the, the yeas were 18 and the nays were 35. Eight. Nope. <laughs> uh, without objection, Mr. Murphy will be recorded on the vote. How do you wish to vote? Mr. Bur Murphy vo uh, votes aye. So Murphy of Pennsylvania, aye. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 19 yeas and 35 nays. 19 ayes, 30. 35. 35 noes. No. The amendment's not agreed to. Yeah. Now I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from Florida. As, uh, I understand you have an amendment. The amendment pertains to this title and it has been available for two hours. Is that? Yes, Mr. Chair. At least. Uh, the clerk will report the Castor Amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Ms. Castor. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentlelady from Florida is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment, which I am introducing jointly with Representative Inslee, clarifies that states are not prohibited by the Public Utilities Regulatory Policy Act from pursuing the kinds of renewable energy incentive programs that we know work well. Uh, I want to recognize the important work of my uh, friend, Mr. Inslee. Uh, he has been a leader in pursuing policies that remove barriers to the deployment of renewable energy, uh, and we all appreciate his efforts. One of the most effective types of renewable energy incentive programs is the feed-in tariff. Under this concept, folks who wish to install a renewable energy device like a solar panel or a business uh, like wind farms in concert with the utility are guaranteed that the energy produced uh, will be purchased as a, at a reasonable set rate of return. So as they make th their investment to generate power, they know they will be able to sell that power at an attractive rate. Several states are considering adoption of feed-in tariffs. California has been a leader on this front. State legislatures in Washington, Minnesota, Michigan, and Illinois uh, have looked at this issue. This amendment clarifies, uh, clarifies the law to allow states 
that choose to do so, uh, that choose to adopt feed-in tariffs as part of their renewable energy efforts, may, it says they may do so. Uh, this amendment does not tell states they must adopt uh, a feed-in tariff, and it doesn't even say that states should adopt feed-in tariffs. It just allows them to do so and clarifies a disputed part of the law. Uh, in my home state of Florida, the city of Gainesville became the first city in the United States to implement a feed-in tariff for solar power in February. Uh, I note that uh, the city of Gainesville is located in my good friend Mr. Stern's uh, congressional district. C Gainesville's program has already met with a resounding success with applications for the program meeting the cap for the next several years. Uh, but Gainesville is now is becoming a destination for new jobs, clean energy jobs for solar installation companies who are hiring Floridians and rapidly rolling out more solar for our state. So this is a very narrowly tailored amendment that says only that uh, PURPA does not stand in state's way in the state's way if they make that choice. And I'll yield to Congressman Inslee. Uh, thank you. I just want to point out a couple of things. We, you know, part of this bill, we are really in a race with other countries. And other countries have found out that a little policy called a feed-in tariff can be spectacularly successful. In Germany, over 300,000 jobs have been created in large part because of the feed-in tariff, which simply gives businesses the stability of a fixed rate for their electricity and individuals. They now have 15 percent of their energy from renewable sources. In contravention of some of the folks who have said about Spain, uh, you look at the Spanish experience. Uh, I'll cite uh, uh, a fellow from the Spanish uh, country, where, uh, a little county called Navarre, where they've adopted this, where they have said they've had great economic growth debunking the Heritage uh, Foundation study that has been cited. But most importantly, I would refer members to a new study from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. This is the federal government National Enron Laboratory, and they did a study about this feed-in tariffs. And they basically concluded that this system of giving a fixed price for electricity can be as or more effective than any other single thing we can do. And the beauty of it is that once a business can go to a bank and say, I've got a fixed contract at a fixed price, it creates huge economic opportunity. It has in 40 other countries. We are behind those countries in the adoption of this, of this policy. All our amendment will do will allow local governments to move forward should they desire to do so. This is experience internationally we know has worked. We just want to free country or our counties and cities to move forward, and I commend this amendment. The gentleman's time has expired. Are there members chairman, seeking sorry, recognition? The chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Texas, that was Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm going to try not to be cranky. Um, it is late. This is apparently our last amendment. This is probably the worst amendment we've seen today. I, I say probably because we've, some of you on your side would say some of ours have been pretty bad, and some of us on our side would say some of those that you have offered have been pretty bad. But this amendment gives the state legislature or the regulatory authority in a state the ability to set a rate for the sale of electric energy by facility generating electric energy from renewable energy sources above the market. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a rate-making authority above the market. Now, we're going to have a debate tomorrow on the definition of renewable. We're going to try to include it's a, a, a definitional change from renewable to, to, uh, to clean energy and include nuclear and clean coal and some others. But under the current definition for renewable, with the exception of biomass and perhaps wind power, almost every other renewable in this bill is going to be at an above market price. Solar voltaics is pick a number above the market right now. I mean, a thousand percent above the market. Uh, in Spain, where they have something similar to this, uh, solar voltaic is guaranteed a price about 600 percent above the market. I mean, I don't see how 
with a straight face, this amendment can be offered, and you can still claim that you're not going to rise, you're not going to raise prices. This is guaranteed. This is the guaranteed price increase for electricity generation. I mean, it, there's no other way to look at this. Um, and to add insult to injury, it says notwithstanding any other provision of this act or the Federal Power Act. So all the things that Mr. Doyle has attempted to do and Mr. Green has attempted to do and Mr. Boucher has attempted to do to offset or mitigate some of the potential price increases, this one amendment undoes every one of those. The only saving grace is that we just don't have enough renewable energy yet in this country that it's going to be a big percentage of the total energy mix. Um, this is a strong no, Mr. Chairman. I mean, a strong, strong no. With that, I would yield to Mr. Stern. Well, your, your time has expired. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I yield back. I thought I had two, but I'm negative two minutes. Yeah. Uh, anybody on the Democratic side, are we ready for the question? Mr. Inslee? Just very briefly, I want to note that Mr. Barton's honor that I had brought the worst amendment today has guaranteed my re-election in the first congressional district. I just want to I said you. probably now. I wasn't definitive. <laughs> I'll give you the probably. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Stearns. Uh, strike the last word. Um, the gentlelady had mentioned my hometown, uh, my Gainesville, which is in my congressional district. Um, I would say to her, I've had businesses in Gainesville. Their utility rates are higher than they are in Ocala, higher than Leesburg, higher than Clay County in Jacksonville, Bradford County, Stark. I think what you're proposing as a mandate, as Mr. Barton pointed out, is wrong. Now, Gainesville is doing this voluntarily. If Gainesville wants to do it, fine. Let every city in America do this voluntarily. But not to do what you've done, which is bring in government agencies, the federal and put federal mandates and force communities to do it, I don't think it's a... And will the, the gentleman yield? yield? Will the gentleman yield? Not, not quite yet. So, um, I mean, if, if Gainesville's doing this and they want to do it, fine. But I can assure you that they're paying higher cost businesses than the businesses in all the other communities. Now, Gainesville's a little separate community because it has the University of Florida and it has the Veterans Hospital. It has teach, uh, Shan's Teaching Hospital has a huge amount of built-in infrastructure. Uh, but I suspect that it's increasing the cost if they're having to, the utility company is forced to buy it back at a predetermined rate which is much higher. Now, I don't know that for a fact. Perhaps you can confirm that. Is the Gainesville utility buying this back from homeowners at a predetermined price that is much higher than the going rate. So will the gentleman yield? Yes, I'd be glad to yield. Yes, the, the Chamber of Commerce of Gainesville is strongly in favor because while the rate structure is a little bit different, uh, the value here uh, is the best value going in, in energy production because what it is going to do is unleash uh, a whole new market for new jobs. You have solar installation companies now locating in Gainesville near the University of Florida. We'll reduce pollution. But the beauty of this is that we're not mandating anything. We're just saying now with the renewable energy standard that comes in, uh, utilities will have a greater incentive to find, uh, to produce energy based on re renewables. We're not mandating anything. We're saying this is an option for utilities uh, and for states. They don't have to do it. We're not even saying they should do it. But it's an option, and it will be a very valuable option to the communities that take the lead. And after extensive debate uh, in the city of Gainesville uh, and public hearings, uh, they're leading the way, and they're going to lead the way in job creation as well. Uh, reclaiming my time, I would say that perhaps your amendment is not even needed if the city of Gainesville is doing this, as you say, successfully, and you're saying other communities could also do it successfully, then why is there a need for federal Yeah, I'll exp legislation? The gentleman will yield. Sure. 
there's a there's a an argument over the law, and council might want to address this as well. Some states. Some states have acted, uh, like Minnesota, others, uh, like Iowa, thought that the federal PURPA law preempted them from moving forward with the feed-in tariff uh, concept. So that, that blocks new wind, wind farm businesses uh, and solar entrepreneurs. Uh, this just clarifies the law that nothing in PURPA prohibits utilities and uh, states and municipal utilities from pursuing the All renewable... All right, just reclaiming my time, I think I'll ask council then, if the bill, if we did not have this bill, could the 50 states in America voluntarily uh, do this, adopt renewable energy incentives Yes or no? No, not under current federal law. The Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act in Section 210 adopted a standard for the purchase of cogenerated power and renewable energy that was a set at the avoided cost that the utility would otherwise pay for power. That avoided cost was deemed to allow an incentive to provide that kind of energy. Could, could under this bill, a, a state which can do it voluntarily, could they do it in such a way that the utility would pay it back at the market rate instead of an increase above the market rate so that the utility would buy it back but they wouldn't have to add more cost because they're paying higher percentage for this than, a, than the market rate is? Do you follow what I'm saying? Well, with, without legislation similar to this provision, a state regulatory commission could not order its utilities to pay more uh, under some interpretations, and there have been some cases in court that have held this way, a state regulatory commission could not require its utilities to pay more than the avoided cost of other forms of electricity, even if they felt there was a special value from that form of All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Are we ready for the vote? No, Real quickly, no. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Would you take a two minute? I, I will try. Yes, sir. Hey, here's, here's a difference in equality. Republicans want more energy supply to have equal low prices. The Democrats through this bill want everyone to have equal energy costs all at the high rate. And here's an example. The, uh, we, we're talking about Spain, and here is the uh, report from the Universidad Rey Juan Carlos, Dr. Graybiro Calzada Alvarez, who says that during the 2004 general election campaign, the socialist candidate, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero, promised a reorientation of the energy model towards one that is more centralized, more diversified and safe, less wasteful, and also more solidarity, meaning it requires payment by many into a system for the common good for which they achieve little benefit. The program proposed an initial feed-in tariff scheme, which has the effect of artificially increasing the price paid for electricity produced by renewables. Why are we artificially increasing the price paid for renewables? Why are we concerned about this bill? Because this is really, as we said in hearings, the, the largest grab for power that many of us have ever seen through energy, through a socialist state, and this is a primary example with, with the of, yield. of what failed in Spain. With the Spain, no, Spain had 17.5% unemployment. The report says for every one green job created, two and a half. 2.2 jobs were lost. <laughs> now, if we want to go in Spain's example... Will the gentleman yield? No, if we want to go in... You can have five minutes on your own time. If we want to go in Spain's example and have this initial feed-in tariff scheme, which failed in Spain, adopt this amendment. I yield back my time. Miss, we're ready for the vote. Can I, just have, can I just have 30 seconds? I'm just, can I just have 30 seconds? The gentleman's I'm, recognized I'm, for th one minute. I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled as, as, my, as my colleagues over there are in the, the throes of trying to decide what's wrong with this amendment. 
they've gone wildly from this requires something that now Mr. Stearns has enlightened us all that it doesn't require anything at all. And then somehow my, my colleague from Illinois, who seems to be obsessed with Spain, finds Spain some in this, in, somewhere in, the, in, in this, in this. But I don't see it anywhere. It's not that long. But I don't see anything about Spain. How did the gentleman become so obsessed with Spain? Okay, I if, think this is an amendment. If that the gentleman, because it is at an. Best, it, at best, I know. This, at best, this impacts. He's asking me. At best, this impacts Florida. And when did returning rights to the states create a centralized. Florida used to be part of Spain. Government long time. energy. <laughs> what do you say? What do you say? Florida used to be part of Spain. <laughs> Spain and socialism both start with an S. I, 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 just, I just want to say, Amen. I just want to say, Mr. Chairman, the, 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 the offer of the amendment, and apparently everyone has to join with Inslee to do anything now that he wrote that book, but now it wrote the word may here to make it clear, and in her remarks said very clearly it didn't require anything. And then my colleagues on the other side burst into hysteria that we've gone to socialist Spain somehow. I mean, you might have reasonable opposition to this amendment, but you sure haven't stated it yet. Don't encourage Come them. Come on. <laughs> Come on. All right, let's focus on this. If the, uh, hey. if the gentleman would show up. Waterboarding. That's more. That's, let's focus on waterboarding, damn it. That's more we will, relevant. Uh, now, this is our last amendment. We will now proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the Castro Amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. no. The ayes, ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a roll call. You want a roll call. Well, let's go to a roll call. I'd ask unanimous consent that every Republican vote be counted double in the spirit of above market vote counting. Objection. Let's have that disclosed to the American people. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman, aye. Mr. Dingle. Aye. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Markey. Yes. Aye. Votes aye. Mr. Markey votes aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. The clerk will Pallone, suspend the, the, the roll. Uh, we, we must have order so members can hear it. And I do want to announce there will be a, a colloquy. Uh, we won't have any further amendments, but there will be an important colloquy uh, uh, that will take place after the, um, after the vote is completed. Please proceed now that we have order. Okay. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes aye. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Green. Ms. DeGette. Ms. DeGette votes aye. Mrs. Capps. Mrs. Capps votes aye. M Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Mr. Inslee, Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross, Mr. Ross, aye. Mr. Weiner, Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson, Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield, Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson, Mr. Barrow, Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy, Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, no. Mr. Hall. 
Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes no. Mr. Whit Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, no. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Pitts. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Mrs. Myrick. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. I didn't hear you. Sorry. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania also votes no. Mr. Blackwood. I'm sorry. Ms. Blackwood. Get out there. Okay. She's there? No. Okay. Mr. Gingrich. I can't. Mr. Gingrich, I'm sorry. I can't see her. <laughs> Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes no. Yeah, I got him. Have all members responded to the roll? Mr. Melanson. Okay. Mr. Mr. Melanson votes yes. Any member wish to uh, change his or her vote? Okay. Not the clerk will tally the vote. Mr. Murphy and I would like you to count those numbers in English, not in Spanish. to re respond to the vote. On that, on that vote, Mr. Chairman, the yeas were 32, the nays were 18. 32 ayes, 18 nays, the uh, amendments agreed to. I want to recognize Ms. Matsui for a colloquy with me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to say on the finale, so after this, everybody can go home. But I want to thank you very much. I'm entering into this colloquy with you to seek your future commitment to an important section in this bill. I'm encouraged that this bill starts to address the transportation sector as well as the energy sector. Transportation accounts for 30 percent of the greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere each year. Therefore, effective climate change legislation must include a transportation component, component if we are going to achieve the emission reduction levels that scientists say are vital to saving our planet. Mr. Chairman, I appreciated working with you on Section 222, which seeks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through comprehensive transportation efficiency and land use planning. Specifically, this section authorizes the EPA to make grants to states and MPOs to accomplish three things. First, it supports improving data collection, modeling, and monitoring systems. Second, it awards funds to assist in the development of comprehensive plans by states and MPOs. Third, it provides resources for implementation of plans such as efforts to increase transit construction of bike facilities and more. Currently, Section 132 distributes emissions allowances among states for energy efficiency programs such as transportation, transportation efficiency like Section 222. 
However, within Section 132, funding is currently only limited to transportation planning. Mr. Chairman, I would like to get your commitment to work together with the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee going forward to address all aspects of Section 222, from modeling to development of plans to implementation of plans to be eligible for funding. States and cities will need resources to not only effectively plan, they will also need resources necessary to implement strategies like increasing transit use. For example, public transportation last year prevented the emission of more than 37 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. Those emission savings are equivalent to the electricity used by 4.9 million households. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to work with you on this issue going forward to ensure that the transportation sector is properly recognized and the communities receive the resources they need. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield to you for your thoughts. Generally yield to me. I, I thank you, um, Ms. Matsui. I appreciated your efforts throughout this process to address the transportation sector's contribution to global warming pollution. The provisions of Section 222, which are based on your Smart Planning for Smart Growth Act, are an important first step. I'm pleased that the bill includes allowances that states can use to plan to reduce global warming pollution from transportation, and I'll be glad to continue to work with you to ensure that the states and localities have the resources they need to implement the plans they develop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, the chair wants to announce that uh, the desk will be open as early as, no earlier, but as early as 9 a.m. So if members want to drop off their amendments. And secondly, if you wish to leave your binders and papers uh, without having to take them out of the room, they'll be here, the room will be secure. And I can't imagine anybody wanting to steal uh, the um, copies of the um, amendment in the nature of a substitute or the original base text of the bill since they uh, are quite voluminous. So uh, as you wish, if you decide you want to leave your papers here, they will be uh, here tomorrow when we return. That uh, concludes our business for tonight. We will reconvene at 10 a.m. The House Energy and Commerce Committee continues to consider amendments to the Energy and Climate Bill tomorrow. You can see that live on C-SPAN 3 at 10 a.m. Eastern. In a few moments, President Obama announces new higher mileage standards for cars sold in the U.S. In a half hour, Secretary of State Clinton on humanitarian aid to Pakistan. And in an hour, Republican senators report on their recent trip to the